Browns fans, join the Dog Pound on the road this season with True Fan Travel, an official fan experience partner of the Cleveland Browns. Travel to stadiums across the country with other Browns fans and experience the games like never before. This trip includes everything, a private charter flight, hotel, an all-inclusive tailgate, game tickets, boat party, transportation, and more. Cheer on the Browns in New Orleans and party with Cleveland Browns legend Kevin Mack. Visit TrueFanTravel.com today and reserve your ultimate Browns travel package. For the Burning River Sportscast. Where were you when the Browns stopped winning on that September day? Were you watching the game with your little children or listening on some old interstate? Did you feel guilty because you remember winning? Is it really Vegas when it's just the Browns sinning? Did you call up your brother and tell him you hate them? Did you begrudgingly turn on another game? I'm just a singer of simple songs. I'm a plain old football sap. I watch ESPN, but I'm not sure I could tell you the difference between a sweep and a trap. But I've watched this team play and I've seen Deshaun. We haven't won this division since before I was born. Anxiety and depression are two things the Browns gave us. But the greatest is Chubb. But the greatest is Chubb. Where were you when the Browns stopped winning? On that September day. At one and three, things are bad and getting worse. Where do the Browns go from here? Wake me up when September ends. We'll break it all down for you next on the Burning River Sportscast. Leave Mike DeWine alone. <laughs> Cincinnati's in Kentucky. Cincinnati is clearly in Kentucky. I took a flyer. Gotta love bacon. Yeah. Number two. The other white meat. It really floored my wife when she saw people spending the day with us <laughs> watching the Browns instead of touring D.C. She's like, and I said, you just don't get it. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> they're Browns fans. That's why they do that. This, this was one of the worst feeling losses that I can remember. And the Cowboys game was only three weeks ago. <laughs> and the Giants game was last week. <laughs> You know, let's let's get into the Browns here. We try, you know. Uh, yeah, enough with the pleasantry. What the <laughs> hell is going on with this football team? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, when the offense continues to go three and out, and that defense is just on the field for what seems like forever. I mean, how frustrating is mm-hmm. that for a defensive player? Yeah, it, it can definitely get frustrating. Um, but we always tried to, you know, look at the glass half full. I'm like, well, I get more TV time now. You know what I mean? It's. <laughs> it's- they may question our sanity, but they'll never question our loyalty. Ain't hey, nobody want a goddamn McDouble. <laughs> like, let's just stop here. I'm gassed up again. Welcome into the Burning River Sportscast presented by the fine folks at Tap In Media. I'm Kenny Thunder, joined by a man whose genitals look surprisingly like the I-4 Corridor Eyesore. He's Red Hot Ronnie Jams. We are boneless today. We'll have to make do without our calcium fortified friend who is taking in a final vacation for the year of this family. Hopefully he doesn't cross paths with the Jonas Brothers in his travels because I know he wouldn't be able to resist, and an affair would lead to a costly divorce. So good luck, Bone. <laughs> good luck, buddy. <laughs> Back to Red Hot. Where can our listeners find the dopest dope they ever heard on a podcast? The newly minted number one ranked football podcast and all of good pods as well as the unofficial podcast of Cleveland Browns backers everywhere. And the official podcast of some Cleveland Browns somewhere. Somewhere. Uh, you can find our podcast wherever you get your podcast. I'm talking Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, YouTube Music, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, Castro, Good Pods. 
which we are number one, the number one football podcast, <laughs> and the number two sports podcast this week, uh, and so many more. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube, the only place that you can find our video podcast. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Our handle for all those socials is at Burning River Sportscast. We are on X, the artist formerly known as Twitter, with the handle at Burning River Pod. And while you're at it, check out our merch, www.thetappinmedia.com backslash shop. Uh, got all kinds of stuff in there, River Gear, Chub Gear, uh, Brook Park Browns Gear. Woo. Uh, we mentioned earlier on a, yesterday on our uh, live show, Sunday on our live show, that uh, we'll be adding some stuff this week. Yes. So that'll be in there by the time this is out. For sure. So check it all out. Uh, but today on the show, this is what you can look forward to. Dog of the Week, Division Roundup, Around the NFL, Hot 3, an interview with the Browns Backers group this week, the Washington, D.C. area Browns Backers Club. Their name's almost longer than ours. Yeah, it's, it is. <laughs> uh, King of the North, gassed up the Week 5 preview for the game against the Commanders. Our defensive cor- correspondent, John Hughes. And oh, so much more. So much more. Uh, but it turns out we were all right. There was no reason to have any hope that this team will turn it around out west against Las Vegas. And spoiler alert, there is no reason to expect anything different this week. So grab me a paper bag and start referring to me as Anonymous Browns fan because I am embarrassed to show my face rooting for this team in any capacity, but I also feel a totally unwarranted sense of pride for having stuck with them for this long. And I will continue to do so until my dying day. That's what we do. Now let's get this thing started with the Burning River News Story Story of of the the Week. All right, so for this week's Burning River News Story of the Week, Cincinnati is always crying. Yes, they are. They're always crying. Cincinnati officials last week unveiled a master plan for a $1.25 billion renovation of the Bengals' Paycor Stadium, and Hamilton County commissioners made one thing clear. If state taxpayers help Clevelanders pay for a stadium, Cincinnati wants its, quote, fair share. Kenny. How do you feel about this? Well, I feel like if they want their fair share of publicly funded dollars, they need to go to their governor in Kentucky, Andy Bashir, and ask him for money. Yeah. They're, they're barking up the wrong tree. Leave Mike DeWine alone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you were a part of Ohio, that would be one thing, but you're not. You're not. Cincinnati's in Kentucky. Cincinnati is clearly in Kentucky. Speaking of which, Kentucky. Speaking of which, the Cincinnati is in Kentucky shirts are now available. On, on www.thetappamedia.com backslash shop in the Burning River Sports Cast shop. Yes. So because go Cincinnati get yours. is in Kentucky. Absolutely. Where else would it be? It's not in Ohio. It's definitely not here. We don't claim them. We they ain't even got an airport. We ain't paying for their stadium. Yeah, yeah they ain't got an airport. And also, did you look at the renderings for this thing? I mean, it basically it's just the same looks, stadium. It looks like Paycor Stadium. All right, good job, already. guys. Real original. <laughs> they had like some new restaurants, and they were like one point yeah. two five billion dollars. Here we go. You know why Ohio doesn't want to pay for your stadium? Because nobody likes Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> they love Cleveland. Like, That's why they're paying for our stadium. <laughs> the only improvement that they're getting is like an indoor training facility. Which, like, Ooh. how are you? How did like how does your owner not just build that anyway? Like, yeah. you, you wonder why your team sucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your owners are bankrupt. Don't talk to us. You, like the reason you're coming to the state for money is because uh, you have no money. <laughs> It'd be, like you guys don't bring anything to this state. You just you just want money. You just take take take. Like at least like a spoiled at, child. At least the Browns. Uh, w- you know, I don't know. Seventy five, eighty, ninety five percent of the the state loves the Browns. Yeah. The rest of them vote for it's ther- root, they root for the Kentucky Bengals. Therapeutic. I hate I hate the Bengals. Being a Browns fan just builds character. They're being, always crying. Being a Kentucky, a Kentucky Bengals fan grows armpit hair. Yeah, they're always <laughs> even. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah, they're they're, I, they're just always crying. <laughs> always crying. I hate Cincinnati. Worst fans in the game. Uh, but with that, let me. Take one more moment before we get to the football side of things and remind everybody to call the Burning River Sportscast Hot Take Hotline. That's right. Don't forget to call and leave your hot take on the Hot, hot take, take Hotline. Line. Remember, these are hot takes. We want hot takes. We want hot it's takes. Not a sex we hotline. want hot takes. 330 220 330-227-8080. 330-227-8080. Call now. Operators are Hello. not standing by, but we'll put your takes on the air and we'll talk about them. We sure and it'll will. be a lot of fun. Heck yes. Uh, and then next up here, we're doing things a little bit differently. Um, obviously, we're not going to do the week four recap uh, because the week four recap happened on Sunday live. 
On all of our social medias. Okay, not all of them. It happens on Facebook, YouTube, and X. Most of our social medias. Yeah, some of them. Most of them. Most, all of them. Most, most of them. Most all of them. Most of them. Eventually, it'll be on uh, 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 TikTok as well, but not yet. TikTok Live. Yeah. Uh, so if you're looking for that week four recap, then go back into whichever podcast platform you're listening or watching on uh, and find our live episode from Sunday. Again, those will be live every Sunday after the game. I can give you the recap. We suck. We lost. <laughs> and there you have it. Uh, and so with that, let's get into the Burner River Sportscast Dog of the Week. <laughs> Doesn't matter, man. You got to play tough people in the National Football League. You got to be ready. And we got to be the dogs that we are every time we step on there on Sunday and be ready to attack. And don't stop until uh, we're in that locker room. I'm just excited, you know. Uh, so after the fan vote uh, that was conducted... On our social medias today, uh, we have... Big news. We have our Dog of the Week. In case anyone didn't know, we nominated three uh, three different potential dogs, dogs of the week uh, from the game on Sunday, which was really hard because there wasn't a lot of bright spots yeah, in that game. We know it was hard. We did our best. Yeah, we did our best. So uh, just to recap there, uh, Kenny nominated Jerome Ford. I nominated JOK. And Bone, even though he wasn't there, uh, I kind of nominated Bones for him, was Rodney McLeod with the scoop and score. Uh, but with that, this week's Burning River Sportscast Dog of the Week is... J-O-K. So J-O-K came into this thing, uh, and, and he... All, all season long, he's been kind of everywhere for the Browns, for the defense, right? Uh, he's been the one bright spot. I mean, Miles Garrett has played well throughout the season so far. But JOK um, has, has been everywhere this season. Uh, he's in on almost every tackle, it feels like. Where's the Guardian cap? His Guardian cap is dope AF. I don't care what anybody says. I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> um, but he had nine tackles, seven solo tackles, and a tackle for loss in this one. And again, it just seemed like every time there was a play that needed to be made, he was the guy that made it. I just think they look like big head mode on NFL Blitz. That's why they're good. <laughs> That's why they're good. Um, I guess you had to enter a cheat code to get those. <laughs> speaking of uh, uh, Guardian Caps, you, did you see that uh, Whiteheart or whatever, the tight end that nobody knows who he is? Uh, did you see that he he wore a Q collar this week? Um, I, I didn't until you told me. Yeah. So, <laughs> in case anybody check those things out, I mean, I, it, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, you know, I think we're going to plan something to to kind of go over both of those, just to explain them to to the listeners uh, what they are and and what they do essentially for these players. So. Um, essentially, another concussion protocol, yeah. like fix. So, yeah, good, good, you know, good good for. Um, you know, youth football, a lot of parents are feeling like they don't want to let their kids play football. So the more and more technology advances to help reduce the amount of head injuries, the better. Yeah. And I'm all for these guys wearing these things. If it prolongs your, not only your playing career, but your life after football and your quality of life after football, like I'm all for that. Um, so good on JOK for, sure. for, for wearing the guardian cap and, and white heart for uh, wearing the Q, the Q collar. Uh, but again, JOK was everywhere. Uh, I know you talked about it on the live show. His his tackle that where he just blew, he just that, blew guy. that guy up. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it was one of the best tackles I've seen this year from a, from the Browns defense. I mean he just absolutely annihilated. I forget it, it might have been Zamir White or whoever. Uh, that's their it's right just guy. so fun to watch it because he's fast and he just comes with a reckless abandon every time he's coming to the just ball. Just full body, full ass. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, JOK never goes. He half-ass. always goes full ass. Yeah, he always goes full ass. Um, but with that, uh, we'll get into other Browns news here. Um, we had some good things happen after the game. We did. Uh, we found out Najoku expected back this week. Um, so some much needed help in the passing game because the passing game's ass. But let's keep in mind it was a high ankle sprain. So expected back is different than expected back one hundred percent healthy. That's true. That's fair. Uh, I, I like that I'm you're just, trying to find. We're, we're in saying. this like uh, you know this law right now. Like it's been pretty bad lately. So I'm you're just, trying to find the negative and everything. I'm just trying. To you're just, you're back to the most pessimistic <laughs> Browns fan I ever met. I'm just trying to temper expectations because look, I'm excited to see Njoku back too. But let's just remember, like that's not an injury that just goes away in season. Yeah, I mean that's a fair point. That's a fair point. It is a, a tough injury. Um, and then the news we've all been waiting for, and the reason why I wore. The Nick Chubb Batman shirt Batman. today. I'm Batman. Uh, Nick Chubb's practice window has officially been open, and the Browns have 21 days to activate him from the time that they opened it. Um, with that being said, 
The two most likely dates for his return are, are 1013 or 1020. Um, 1020 is actually probably more likely because that's the first game back after the Browns' current road, chi- road trip, uh, and it will be against Cincinnati at home. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm pretty excited for this. Yeah, I mean, these division games are going to be of utmost importance given the start to the season. So they're going to need to basically clean sweep the division to yeah. get back into this thing. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It, it, there's no other way, right? <laughs> it's the only way to get back. Keep losing season. games. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, and I guess that plays right into my question: is is it going to be too late when Nick Chubb comes back? Like, are we already going to be out of it? I mean, they're going to have to steal a win here somewhere. Um, look, I look, we sort of said like at the beginning of the year, like this is the easy part of their schedule, but and they've lost almost every game. Um, and and this week looks like the most daunting of all, given the way the Commanders have been playing lately. So. Yeah. Let's remind everybody, 42-14 to 14 last week against the Cardinals. Yeah, uh, their defense finally showed up in a big way, um, and Jaden Daniels looks like everything he was promised to be. Yeah. So, I mean, Jaden yeah. Daniels has played better in the last two weeks than, than Deshaun Watson has played in three years. <laughs> Let's not rehash this again. Well, I'm just saying. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. Uh Bottom line, I just can't wait until Nick Chubb plays football again. It's one of my favorite things to do is watch Nick Chubb play football. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was watching one of the pregame shows this weekend, and uh, it was um, – because it was like – it was like one of Nick Chubb's like coming out parties against the Raiders, like when we first oh, played yeah. the Raiders, and he just, just – He had like a record-setting day that day. He had two long touchdowns. All over and, them. Yeah. It was a glorious thing. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, you just forget the just the absolute – grace and strength in which that guy moves and how mesmerizing it is to watch yeah i can't wait i just i need nick chubb football back in my life yeah let's hope that he's you know back back to 100 percent too yeah uh but with that let's get into the division roundup all right so we're starting things off here with the Bengals. Uh, last week they played on Monday night, so we were waiting for that game to finish uh, before we added it to the standings. It didn't really matter one way or the other because we all picked them to win, and they lost to, to the, the Commanders. commanders. Uh, so we all got a, a loss on our on our uh, records there. Uh, Cincinnati this week played the Panthers. Uh, they did beat the Panthers. They lost the Commanders. Uh, this was before the Commanders beat the Cardinals, uh, forty-two to fourteen. So apparently the Commanders are pretty good, but uh, <sighs> but yeah. They beat Cincinnati. Beat the Panthers this week, and uh, I was right. Bone was right, and you were wrong. I took a flyer. That's fair. It's usually those cost you. I thought maybe the Panthers were going to get things together, but they're the they Panthers. Didn't. They didn't. Um, next up here, Baltimore. Baltimore beat the Bills. Uh, everybody was wrong there. The Bills were playing phenomenal football, and they didn't just they didn't the Bills didn't just lose to the Ravens. The Raiders humped them. The Ravens. Or, I'm sorry, the Ravens. Yeah, they got Raiders on the brinks. We just lost to them so bad. But yes. the Ravens humped, well, humped. The I, I mean, Bills. literally from right out the gate, the Ravens' first play went for 82 yards yeah. uh, touchdown. Um, I'll tell you what, the addition to Derek of Derek Henry to the Baltimore team, it finally showed up. Has finally paid its first dividend, and he looked awesome. If that's what the league can look forward to the rest of the year, everyone's in trouble. Everyone's in trouble because. I, look, there's a few things that we know to be true in the NFL, and ones that, like, if you can run the ball and the other team can't stop you, you, win. you will win the game. <laughs> you win. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they ran the ball over. Good. It wasn't just Deshaun. Yeah. I mean, Deshaun was impressive. Or Deshaun. Uh, Derrick Henry. It wasn't just Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry was impressive. Lamar had a number of nice runs and a touchdown. Uh, and Justice Hill, um, to spell Derrick Henry, is an absolute weapon. What? What? an ultimate spell there like those backs couldn't be like any different right like or more different or like they, oh all three of those guys yeah i mean they just, they're all, just completely they different different, different types of players different skill sets and they just and they just pounded and, they, and the thing is is like they know what their identity is you know and, and you watch like the last couple of years of the browns and how well they run the football and how much they didn't want to um, they just wouldn't embrace that. Like Baltimore embraces that. They go, we like, are yeah, play sure. mean, nasty ass defense. You know why? Uh, Those hardballs are good coaches, and we're going to run the damn ball down your throat, and you can't stop us. And and it's not like Lamar can't throw, but why? Why would you? I mean, he threw for like 156 yards last night. Why? Th- you don't need to throw for anymore when you run for 400 in a game. Yeah, 
Yeah. So we were all wrong there. Um, next up here, Pittsburgh. Uh, Pittsburgh uh, lost to the Colts. Me and you were wrong. Bone called this one. He said the Colts were going to end the streak. Sure did. Uh, it, it got close at the end, though. Feels and there bad. was some... Uh, questionable calls in this i know we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit but there were some questionable calls in this that helped the colts out uh, um, in that win i'll say what might be the most questionable call though is the fact that anthony richardson goes down with a hit pointer comes back in the game and on the ensuing play they run like a quarterback power <laughs> and he gets hurt again literally just <laughs> drilled right in the same hip what? Like, like like what kind of idiot <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That Luckily for dumb. the Colts, though, they got Joe Flacco. Yeah, he's so. the greatest quarterback that ever lived. Yeah. Period. <laughs> I mean, so the, they, the Browns, yeah. like, that was the, is the biggest mistake of their life. Biggest mistake of your lives. Yeah, the, the Browns had kept Joe Flacco for one to two more years. This team would be in the Super Bowl. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Is, yeah. The greatest so, quarterback that ever lived. So, yeah, we were both wrong. Bone was right. And then finally, uh, Cleveland took another ugly loss against the Raiders. Uh, don't worry. We were all right. We knew it was going to happen. I even picked the score right. You did. You did. Uh, if Justin Hopkins would have missed a friggin' extra point, then I would have picked the score right. But you did because you I knew did. something was going to go wrong. I did. I said something <laughs> stupid was going to happen. Yeah. So, uh, so for the AFC North, the standings are as follows. Pittsburgh is on top at 3-1. and one. Baltimore yeah. right behind them at 2-2. Two and two. And, Cl- and Cincinnati and Cleveland at the bottom of the barrel uh one and three so uh current king of the north standings which we'll get more into this a little bit later but bone and i are tied at six and ten and kenny is looking real good there at three and thirteen <laughs> that's an impressive uh impressively poor <laughs> it's been a rough start it's not good i can't deny it i took a flyer <laughs> took a flyer <laughs> took a couple uh but with that let's take a quick trip around the nfl All right, so uh, I mentioned that there were some questionable calls in the the Steelers Colts game. Well, Minka Fitzpatrick got called for unnecessary reference against rough reference, whatever that is. Reference. Uh, Minka Fitzpatrick got called for unnecessary roughness against the Colts, which was, uh, I mean, arguably. One of the worst penalties of this all. This was the worst penalty I've ever, I've ever seen. Uh, and was it was it worse uh, than? So it was unnecessary roughness. What, just take us through the play here, Kenny. Yeah. So the play, and uh, I forget who the target was on the play, but nonetheless, Joe Flacco overthrew the target, and um, the the receiver for the Colts is coming down the sideline. He's already got the corner, whoever is on him, and the safety, Minka Fitzpatrick, is coming across from the top. And um, at the point that the the ball is getting there and Minka Fitzpatrick's getting there, I mean, Minka Fitzpatrick is running full ass <laughs> as fast as you can run because assuming the receiver catches the ball, he's going to have to make a tackle. Yeah, um, obviously. Receiver, you know, obviously the ball is overthrown, so it kind of gets thrown out of bounds. Um, and Minka Fitzpatrick... Puts both arms down to the side and kind of contorts his body in the best way that he can when he's running full ass and makes barely maybe a little bit of incidental contact with helmet to helmet, but it's mostly shoulder to shoulder. But the thing was, like, he made a conscious effort not to hit the guy, but he was running full steam into him. If he catches the ball, he makes a tackle and it's a clean play, right? But because the guy missed the ball, and their bodies collided. It's essentially what they called unnecessary roughness for. And it was just, it's not football anymore. I mean, there wasn't a violent hit. It wasn't helmet to helmet. He made an active movement to not wrap up hit in any way. But, I mean, you can see him literally in real time trying to get both arms just like dead fish into the guy. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, the unfortunate thing is, make it fat. Fitzpatrick is really fast. Yeah, he's a fast guy. And he's all, all these guys are really fast. They're all moving yeah. really fast. I don't. The, there's the, the, my problem with it is there was nothing else that he could do. Right. Instead of not outside of just not being involved in the play, just don't do it. Don't just don't don't even go make a play. <laughs> I mean, that's, no. So so his after the game they asked him about it and his quote was, "I thought we were playing football. I don't know what we're playing at this point." Very different game than what I grew up uh, playing and what I grew up loving. Can't hit any, can't hit nobody hard. Can't be violent. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to say anymore. 
I mean, and he's not wrong, uh, the, but the the worst part about this whole thing is that the flag helped extend a drive. Well, yeah. And I mentioned that, that, uh, at that point it was the Steelers 17, were trying to make a comeback. At that point, it was 17-10, to 10, and it would have been a Steelers ball. Yeah, and, and it extended the drive. They ended up sco- uh, the, the Colts ended up scoring on this. That's what got them to their 24, I believe. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it completely changed the game, and it's just essentially a play that he tried not to. To, he tried not to make contact, and he did. I mean, and how are you supposed to stop that? Like the moment that, like, look, I have no love lost for Minka Fitzpatrick. None. I think he has been a dirty player in the past. I think he's taken liberties with the game. Um, but like at the moment that I'm defending a Pittsburgh player first off, and a Minka Fitzpatrick second off. The only other time we defended Minka Fitzpatrick was the the hit on Nick Chubb because we said Nick Chubb's a force you have to hit him low like i don't care how many people have him wrapped up you have to do something to get him on the ground because we've seen him come out of the other end of uh well it's the rule ups. it's the rule of the game right i guess yeah. if minka fitzpatrick could have done anything differently he could have lowered himself into um i think it was downs into his into his knee <laughs> maybe that would have been a clean play he would have torn his kneecaps right off of his body but because yeah. <laughs> he was moving at warp speed but um but yeah i mean again like the moment that i'm coming to the defense of minka fitzpatrick to be like this was the most bullshit penalty that i've ever seen you just can't officiate the game that way and it's just i don't know i don't know what else you're supposed to do and to your point like it turned the tie of the game that was going to be pittsburgh ball down 17 10 their offense had finally started to find some momentum in the game, um, and they were moving the ball. They had scored, I think, ten unanswered points to that point. So, um, you know, it just it changed the entire complexion and outcome of the game. And I, I hate being the guy that's like the referees changed the game because I'm very much of the mindset that like if it comes down to a blown call. Um, like blown calls happen in every game and you should just be able to overcome them if you're the better team. Like this changed the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's just I, unfair. I don't like Minka Fitzpatrick at all, but I mean, come on. Like if, if, if you don't make a big deal about this one, then you're just going to let everything else slide too. Right. So yeah. Uh, but anyway, so that, that was egregious. Uh, these, these refs need to stop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <It's> sticker. <laughs> And then next up here, uh, did you watch? Did you, did you catch any of the Denver, <laughs> the Denver Jets game? This is the worst game of all time. Worst game I've ever seen. Let me just tell you, <laughs> Bo Nix was twelve of twenty-five for sixty yards and a touchdown. That equates to two point four yards per completion. He he finished the half with negative seven yards. <laughs> like, here's the kicker. He won. He won. He won the game. I mean, this has to go down. I don't know, you know, somewhere in the annals of NFL history, like the it has worst. Has to go to somewhere down in the anal. But <laughs> the that's worst. Terrible. The worst quarterback games to win a game. Like this has to be one of them outside of like a really bad snow game. Oh my god! Just Twelve completions for thirty-five point seven QBR for sixty yards. Yeah, I mean, I guess he didn't throw an interception, so good on him there. But you're did, less than fifty percent. You're at, you're like forty five percent, and that was his first touchdown. So I guess congratulations cool. to Bo Nix. Uh, uh, did the Jets finally come back down to earth? Like they're st- they're like that was really bad. I mean, I don't know if he caught like Robert Sala's press conference after the game. He blamed it on the cadence. <laughs> the guys were jumping off sides, and uh, he said maybe we're going to change the cadence. They asked Aaron Rodgers, um, you, "You think that's something that would make would help here?" And Rodgers was like. I mean, I guess you could go that route, or like we could get good <laughs> going on too, you know, like <laughs> get you know <laughs> like fundamentals instead of taking a tool. You ain't need away, fundamentals when you got heart. <laughs> instead of taking a tool away, we could just get good at the skill. Yeah, <laughs> that makes you. And this is the reason why Aaron Rodgers runs the team. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, I mean, uh, just. God awful game is the bottom line. Terrible. There. So ten, ten to nine, I think it was. Ten to nine. Um, and both kickers. So I thought the Browns game was bad. So <laughs> it was. It was ten to nine, and at the end of the game, Denver had moved the ball into field, field goal position, and I think their kickers will Lutz. He missed his, so they were going to go up thirteen to nine, and then so they gave the ball back to Aaron Rodgers with two a minute and a half, two minutes left, uh, and you're thinking with, with great field position and you're, in your mind, you're just like Aaron Rodgers get on march right down the field and they'll probably you know win on a chip shot, um, not so fast, my friend, as the Corsa would say, um, and they ended up having to kick a fifty yarder and Greg DeLeg just pushed it out of town, so. Bad job out of him. Bad job out of him, too. Yeah. I mean, it was just a really, really ugly game. 
Yeah, and then finally, uh, not really an around the NFL note, but just got to say they come well, in threes. Other, other news. In other news, yeah, they come in threes. Um, today, or in the last like 48 hours, uh, hours. Uh, Dikembe Mutombo died. Uh, big loss in the world of sports. He was only 58 years old, had brain cancer, uh, unfortunately. Uh, didn't I, I don't even know if anybody knew he was sick. Uh, I, I besides know. maybe him and his close family. He's, um, he's what, second all-time, I think, in NBA blocks? Yeah. Um, so just yeah. a huge loss in the NBA And he world. was just kind of one of those like fun, gregarious figures. I mean, there was a lot of like, uh, the commercials and stuff. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. it was just one of those guys that I think like was likable to everybody. Yep, and then uh, next up, Chris Christofferson passed away. Uh, legend. Yeah, I mean, uh, but outside of just being a legendary country music singer, uh, huge in the in uh, not really the movie world in general, but he was, I mean, everybody knows him from Blade, right? Yeah. Like, like he played the, the older, um, what am I trying mentor of Blade or yep. whatever. Uh, it just was phenomenal in that role too. I mean, those movies are a lot of fun. Uh, and it, him and another. Wesley Snipes, like couldn't be any different <laughs> no. in that movie. No. <laughs> like, Chris Thompson is another one of those guys though, that I think just like genuinely was probably, was just a good dude that just people enjoyed being around. I mean, he was involved in all kinds of stuff and, um, I've never heard anybody say a bad word about him. I mean, it's Chris, Chris, Chris Christopherson. For yeah. Sake. Plus he's stuck with like the, the old world names. He was literally <laughs> Christopher Christopherson. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you can't get any better than that. No. Uh, and then finally, uh, probably the biggest one out of all these, uh, Pete Rose passed away today at the, uh, we're recording this on Monday, he passed away today at the age, I think it was 83. 83. Um, and just one thing I want to say here is Pete Rose, especially in the last probably 15 years or so has really, done a lot of apologizing, a lot of rebuilding his image, um, done a lot of good things for communities, a, good, a lot of good things for baseball in general. Longer than that, even. Uh, yeah, and, and I just want to say, what a really bad job out of the MLB to not let this guy in the Hall of Fame before he passed away. Like, now you're going to, and we all know what's going to happen. Po- posthumously, they're going to they're gonna induct him into the Hall of Fame, and it's, it's going to mean nothing. I mean, it, it obviously it'll mean something, but it's going to it's yeah. going to mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. It's it's, it's this gesture of we we fucked up when you were alive, so it, let's try and, and and fix it when you're gone. It's just such a petty thing. There's, yeah, I don't know. A he single, was betting on his team to win. I don't know a single person at this point that even had a problem with it outside of the MLBs. Uh, you got bigger problems. You you got you got steroids in baseball, which they're allowing them to vote on now. Nobody's gotten in, obviously, but um, still, they're they're on the ballot and they're allowed to be at least voted for. Um, on top of that, you have the whole Astros thing from a few years ago. A bunch of guys on that team are going to be up for Hall of Fame votes, and guess what? Probably some of them are going to get in. And instead, and, and they're they're literally just cheating on the field. And you're going to say Pete Rose isn't allowed in the in the Hall of Fame because he was betting on his team to win. I didn't even know. Connor Stallions was a coach for the Astros. Yeah. It just, uh. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no. This, it, it almost went over my head. <laughs> this, <laughs> this is an absolute uh, tra- travesty, travesty yeah. uh, to mankind. I mean, Pete Rose, to your point, I mean, he's he did every, like, look, we have seen over the years, especially recent years, guys fall from grace and get a second chance. And we've kind of all embraced this as, like, just in American culture that, like, People should get a second chance. That's um, what the country's built on. Pete Rose, by every metric as a ball player, I mean, you could put him in on just about anything, yeah. um, was the, the one of the best of all time. Um, and the fact that we've had this petty argument, like it's just, it just is so small compared to what he accomplished, the kind of guy that he was for his community, the stuff that he's done to rebuild and repair his image. Um, I mean, Jesus, he was involved in Gamblers Anonymous groups and trying and donating yeah. money and his time to those things, money from autographs and things to try and help. Like The, the fact that this man has now passed away without being able to see his name inducted into the MLB Hall of Fame is just absolute just trash. Um, and it's look, just failure top to bottom. When you look at MLB ballparks today, 
and you don't see fans in the stadiums consistently, this is only a small shit part. like this. This is only a small part of it, but this is a part of it. This is the way the MLB runs business. It's the way that they don't market stars accordingly. I mean, Jesus, like they could have made a ton of inroads with people. I mean, the Reds fucking suck. You know, what might fill the stands this year if they had had Pete Rose as a nominee <laughs> into the Hall of Fame. And you don't think a, Reds fans would come out in droves to see him? <laughs> yeah. I mean, no. they would have been. Yeah, I just like they don't. They, it's like if they were running a business, like it would be a bankrupt. Like if they were truly running like a real business. Uh, fortunately, you got TV contracts and all these things that help artificially keep them afloat. But like they just run it poorly. They don't market their players well. And Pete Rose was a big part of that. They're, they're just a huge mistake the way they've handled that whole thing. Yeah, this will go down as is one of the biggest failures in the history of MLB. Honestly, I would love to hear from somebody this that like doesn't believe Pete Rose should be in the Hall of Fame. That's the point. stupid thing is most of the writers that vote on it are like, yeah, we should let him in, but yeah. they still don't. Like, someone give me a good case for why he shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame. Don't worry, I'll wait. Yeah. Meanwhile, you got real cheaters that are... <laughs> I, I, whatever. And you know what? It's like, just... at some point, like, we're going to have to tag to come to grips with that, too, because, like, guys like Barry Bonds... He's out now. He's done. He's out. I mean... Or at but, least he's on the verge of being out. But another one that, like... Steroids are not like you still had to hit the ball. You, you know, like, the this country is missing a well, you whole... Well, just, you just, I mean, not to get too far into the weeds of steroids and baseball, because that's a whole other conversation, but you just talked about ratings being low. Guess when they were the highest? Oh, yeah, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, uh, when people hit dingers. M- McGuire and Sosa battling it out for the home run crown every year. Like, yeah. it was a blast. And this whole Aaron Judge thing last year, he has the record now of clean and hitter. Like, get out of town. And I got to, yeah. I mean, gosh, if there was ever a dude <laughs> that was sneaking juice by somewhere, <laughs> like, that guy's the biggest man on the planet. But the thing is, like, that's a whole generation of baseball players. Yeah. And. It was the norm, just like it was the norm in the '80s and '90s for wrestlers to take it. Yeah, like, and, and you know, I get there's no like wrestling Hall of Fame that equates to like the MLB Hall of Fame. It's totally different kind of entertainment venues, but but this, I'm just saying, like, it was the norm of the time. There were guys that didn't lead the league in home runs that were good in other aspects of the game that probably were using some kind of performance enhancer. Yeah, they just weren't. They just weren't six foot three and two hundred and fifty five pounds and just and just crushing balls like yeah. The, no, this it, country in general is kind of uh, nonsensical about their understanding of steroids and how they work and the effect on the like the whole different conversation like you said. But yeah. again, so, we already went too far into it. So the bottom line Pete here Rose was deserves to was, be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Pete Rose deserve he deserved to be in the Hall of Fame while he was still alive. He's deserved it for. 20 plus years. Uh, but Dikembe Mutombo, Chris Christofferson, and Pete Rose, just rest in peace. Big and, losses for planet Earth. Yeah. We huge, took, we took, huge some, losses we took three week. big L's there. Yeah. Uh, but with that, let's go ahead and get into this week's Hot Three. Hot three. Be in your lungs. I'm the smoke in the sky. I'm the gas in the tank. Gonna turn it up, turn it up. All right, so for this week's Hot 3, uh, pizza toppings. <laughs> pizza toppings, I'm excited. <laughs> I love pizza. How excited are you? Pretty excited. <laughs> I think I'll go first. Okay. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to do, I'm going to let let Bone, uh, we'll, we'll read his first. He's not here. Yeah, he's, <laughs> no, he's alive. Uh, don't make that joke. No, I'm uh, alive. Uh, Bone, for his Hot 3 pizza toppings this week, number three, Bacon. Gotta love bacon. Yeah. Number two. The other white meat. <laughs> Sausage. I'm yeah. seeing a theme here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the bone loves his protein. Loves the meats. Uh, I was going to ask uh, for, for sausage. I know bone's on here, but yeah, you can give me your answer. Like, okay. What kind of sausage do you like on your pizza? Because there's sausage comes in a lot of forms. Yeah, I like like what most people think of sausage when they think of sausage. Just pizza. like what you'd get on like a like the ground sausage, like yeah, from, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, from yeah. Pizza Hut. Yeah, like the hunks of it. I mean, there's other ones that that at times are better, but I, I'm a big fan of more like the crumbly, like the crumbly sausage, where it's broken down into real little pieces, like the teeny tiny stuff. Yeah, like real little balls of sausage. That's good too. I'm a fan of that. That's good too. I, I'll be honest, like when I was growing up, sausage was always my favorite. And then, like, I just kind of grew up, like, I started to like other things better. Yeah, not my favorite anymore. Yeah. But, but Bone's favorite. 
Second favorite. <laughs> uh, number one for Bone, pepperoni. Classic. Um, so bacon, sausage, and pepperoni. That dude loves the meats. Loves the meats. <laughs> uh, so basically, he gets meat lover's pizza every time he oh, gets pizza. Beast. I gotta have my protein. Uh, which <laughs> makes sense. He's Bone. He's Bone. Uh, so Kenny... What do you got? Uh, my hot three pizza toppings. Uh, look, I'm going to be very um, uh, orderly about this. I'm going to go number three. Uh, this one's a little controversial, but you'll see where I'm going here is pineapple. Pineapple. Okay. I love a little bit of the sweet and savory kind of thing going yeah. on. I'm actually with you. I don't understand this. So pineapples don't yeah, belong on pizza. I love, I love pineapple like a, on pizza. Especially a good Hawaiian pizza with like oh. maybe a, a, a <laughs> barbecue and a ham. You know, just Sorry, I got together. excited there. I was <laughs> Bring it all home. Uh, I want pizza now. I'm going to get some on my way home. <laughs> so we'll go a fruit. And then we'll go a vegetable. We'll do banana pepper rings. Hell yes. I love pickled foods. <laughs> 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 banana peppers are high on that list. Uh, my grandpa used to make and can his own peppers out of the garden. Um, we do that every year. This year I didn't get to the peppers fast enough. And they, we had uh, too much going on. They, uh, they're they very similar, though, in the flavor of yeah, like yeah, a banana yeah, pepper yeah. ring. Which yeah. uh, Banana pepper and, and like pepperoni just goes absolute wild in my mouth. Um, and so with that being said. And then with that being said, so we've got a fruit and a vegetable. And now I'll do a bone meat. Uh, <laughs> we have the meats. Uh, it's pepperoni. Yeah. Uh, no secrets there. Classic topping. I, I don't know. Like to me, pizza isn't really a pizza without pepperoni. Like there's there's good. Pizzas. What's your favorite pepperoni? That's what I was getting. Like my favorite pepperoni, right? Um, I'll tell you my number one favorite pepperoni first. Tiny little discs. Near. Uh, do you remember the pepperoni pizza we used to get in school at lunch? It had the little cubes, little dots, little cubes on it. <laughs> yeah, cubed pepperoni is my favorite pepperoni of all time. Ew. Uh, most <laughs> I can't pizza, believe that's your favorite. Most pepperoni. pizza shops don't sell cubed pepperoni. <laughs> There's a reason for that, <laughs> but they will sell the the old world, you know, little discs. Which are, you don't, you don't have a, you don't. I take that back. You often have a bad take, and this is one of them. <laughs> no, that's a great take. <laughs> no, it's not. My my the the, the amount of times a day I think about. Elementary school pizza day and how delicious that flat cardboard piece of pizza was um, in the middle of your school day. There may be a reason you're a big guy. So good. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to like ordering a pizza at a regular place that doesn't serve cubed pepperoni, uh, I'll go for the old world little discs that fill up with tiny the little crispy ones. Oh, you drink yeah. the grease so out of good. them. Yeah. Uh, excellent, excellent. Those are my favorite. And they're just so crispy. Like, it's such a perfect uh, like uh, uh, compliment to the rest of the pizza with oh yeah, gosh, yeah it's like yeah. soft and crispy yeah. and yeah, so, so good but, I'm definitely getting pizza on the way home but cubed is definitely number one on the list that's false but okay <laughs> uh, and my top my hot three pizza toppings uh, number three here I guess this is kind of cheating but I'm going with barbecue chicken um, just because when you get a barbecue chicken pizza the only topping on it is barbecue chicken <laughs> So I know it's kind of like a whole pizza, but it's the only topping on a barbecue chicken pizza. You don't get like chicken. ham and onion on yours? No, I like the, like the barbecue chicken. It's literally just barbecue chicken. Just barbecue chicken. Yeah. Uh, yeah and like around that. us, Giannino's makes a fantastic barbecue chicken they, pizza. They do. Yeah, they got a good, they got a good sauce that they separates do, yeah. them from a lot Good of barbecue sauce yeah. that they put on. Yeah, mm, good barbecue. Yeah. But I like a barbecue chicken with the ham and the I pineapple. do like that occasionally, but I, I just... Giannino's barbecue chicken pizza. Kind of going full Hawaiian on yeah. them, like aloha. I do like that. Yeah. That is good. Uh, next up on my list here, and, and it's going to get redundant here because I know me and you actually have the same favorite pizza, like your go-to pizza, which is pepperoni and banana peppers. That's so let's one. just rip off the Band-Aid here. Number two, banana peppers. Number one, pepperoni. Delicious. Uh, so it's just, yeah, it's just a phenomenal combination. You can't go wrong there. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my... I've that's, really never had a bad piece of pepperoni. No. Like, all pepperoni is Like, unless they just literally didn't cook it. Like, in some (laughs) way, all pepperoni is good. It is. It's all good. Like, I've had bad barbecue I've had meat lovers pizza where they put, like, four different types of pepperoni on it, and I'm like, yes, this is what I like. Like, I've even had bad banana peppers on pizza where they, like, burn them up. You burn know, them up or they, or they or, put the stems in and stuff yeah fuck know? that man get the stems out pick out the seasoned stems bro but like i've never had a bad piece of pepperoni on a pizza no but no. cubed is still the best yeah so uh that's uh, our hot you three agree, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah no wait you tricked me cubed is the best you yes. tricked me no it's not it's, it's not little tiny discs old world <laughs> little tiny discs are the best those are the best the crispy ones uh but that'll do it for hot three uh kenny you know what i think it's time for dump take a dump no. You gotta take a dump. <laughs> no, I do want to get a pizza on the way home. It's time for 
the Browns Backers interview series. Ooh, interviews. Yeah, so we've been doing this uh, interview series since last year. Um, we, we're continuing it through this year, but basically we want to highlight these Browns Backers groups, what great fans they are to the Cleveland Browns, and all the good they're doing in their community. So with that, let's go ahead and get into the next interview in the series. <laughs> Powered by Riverside FM. All right, so for this Browns Backers interview, please help me welcome from the capital of the entire country, the president of the Washington, D.C. area Browns Backers Club, Neil. Yeah. Neil. Neil, thanks so much for joining us. How are you today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, we, we do interviews with Browns Backers clubs uh, from all over the nation, all over the world. We follow the team around mostly. And so tell us a little bit about your chapter. Uh, you know, let, let us know when you were established, viewing location, members, uh, that, that sort of thing. So we were established back in 1988. Um, we currently have four viewing locations. Nice. Uh, one in D.C., one in East Falls Church, one in Gainesville, Virginia, and one in Woodbridge, Virginia. So um, we have lots of options for people who live locally here to come out and watch the games with us. Nice. And so how many members are you guys up to uh, having four locations? Uh, so we have about 157 members. Um, our, our average attendance in D.C. is the highest. That's about 88 people. Then in East Falls Church, it's around 33. Gainesville gets 19. And Woodbridge is small. Um, They have 11. Okay, nice. So you guys kind of spread them out, make it easy for everybody to come out and watch the games with you guys. Yeah, obviously everyone would love to have a viewing location near their home, but (laughs) we just can't, uh, we can't accommodate that. But we we do our best where we think there's a cluster of Browns fans. We try to, you know, get a site and have a site coordinator there uh, to, to take care of any issues. And um, I couldn't do this without my site coordinators. I have four excellent people, excellent volunteers, and uh, they really helped me run the club. Nice, nice. So let me ask you, D.C. is a little bit of like a, it's a destination town. I think people vacation there, sightsee, that sort of thing. Do, do you get a lot of like transient Browns fans just like traveling in for maybe the weekend to stop by at your parties? Yeah, we do get a lot of visitors. Uh, People come to see their kids who live here or uh, they come to vacation. And it really floored my wife when she saw people spending the day with us (laughs) watching the Browns instead of touring D.C. She's like, and I said, you just don't get it. You know, (laughs) they're Browns fans. That's why they do that. But the awesome thing is they tend to buy our T-shirts as a souvenir. So, yeah. Yeah. We love our visitors. It's great. Well, and, and that's kind of a perfect segue because I know a lot of the times uh, a portion of the uh, T-shirts or a portion of the raffles that you guys are doing are going to uh, a charity of your choosing. So uh, talk about charity or community service. Are you guys involved with anything in, in D.C.? Yeah, so uh, we charge dues and we sell T-shirts. Um, our charity is Toys for Tots. And we, we do something a little unique. We split the proceeds between uh, Cleveland and D.C. So kind of to do something, you know, from our current first, our current home and community, but also giving back to where we came from. Yeah. And I know that's kind of a, that, that is a little bit of a staple of, of the Browns backers, right? Like say, you know, it goes, part of it goes towards the Cleveland, uh, I think it's the Cleveland Browns Foundation, correct? And uh, um they kind of get their little bit to disperse among all the different charities they're helping out here locally. Um, so no, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, how many, how many sh- t-shirts do you typically sell each year? Give or take. So it just depends. Uh, <laughs> we, we thought our design this year was really cool. So we're hoping to sell about 200. Um, and from year to year, it just varies uh, on, you know, who, who comes into town and, just if other people like the shirt or not. So this year's design, my wife came up with the concept of having like a map, like kind of like those vacation maps that you see. They're not real maps, but they, they point out different sites and everything. And we have a ode to our uh, four viewing locations as well as some little 
cute, cute sayings like near the na- National Cathedral, we have pray for a Browns win. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, no, that's that's awesome. I'll have to check those out um, because, you know, we're all for collecting the the different Browns backers. So we're uh, to collect them as we go. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, And speaking of selling T-shirts, you might be uh, underselling yourselves a little bit because I know, um, you know, obviously the Browns are in town this weekend. So are you guys getting a lot of people out for that? Um, yeah, I've received lots of emails about folks that are coming out, and uh, we're going to have a Browns Backers Bash uh, at Saturday night on October 5th from 7.30 to 10.30. Uh, we're going to have some special raffle prizes. We're going to do a barking contest, <laughs> and uh, we'll be selling our T-shirts as well. So what hopefully great, folks will come out yeah. and join us at Yard House in D.C. Nice. I haven't. I, I'm sure that happens in other places, but that's the first I've heard of a barking contest. That's actually yeah. an awesome idea. The old bark off, <laughs> if you will. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, with the uh, big Browns backers bash coming, do you guys have alumni or anything that are, that have been assigned to the event? Or are you not saying yet? Or is it a so surprise who it might be? Uh, it's it's still TBD. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm sure, um, I'm sure it'll be somebody uh, that <laughs> someone someone will join us. We're very hopeful. So yeah. Absolutely. Um, go ahead, Kenny. I just had a real quick question. Uh, obviously, you're in the nation's capital, and it's a uh, we're coming down to election day here. Does it get like angsty in DC this time of year? Like just <laughs> like with everything going on. <laughs> Yeah, I, I tend to hide when the political commercials come on. I, you know, take a bathroom break or whatever. Uh, most of our members, you, we keep politics out of it, so they're pretty good about you know not yelling at the TV about that. We just yell at the TV about the Browns. So we, we have a commonality there. So it's all good. I feel like in order to live in D.C., you almost have to do that in life, right? You got to take politics out of everything, or else you're really dividing yourself. And you only you only have the opportunity to be uh, with acquaintances people. with half the people in the city. So, um, yeah, we're we're used to it, so it, it's all good. Yeah. So. Uh, Obviously, big party this weekend. Hopefully, everybody comes out to that, uh, and there's a huge showing. Um, but let's talk about football here a little bit. What are your thoughts on this year's version of the Cleveland Browns? So I'm a little disappointed, um, especially with the offensive line. I know they're banged up, and you know I get it. But with you know eight sacks in a game, that's that's not good. So uh, hopefully, we see improvement there, and uh, the offense can step it up a little bit. Absolutely, and yeah, the eight sacks in a game is about as bad as it gets. It's but so bad. <laughs> um, no, and and uh, I'm I'm surprised a little bit. You're 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 just a little disappointed. But <laughs> I should, I guess, I should understand that you are a uh, uh, longtime Browns fan, so you're, you've seen you're worse. Used to the disappointment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So I was uh, at the uh, Red Right '88 game uh, oh. when I was about 13 years old. Uh, and then I was also at the drive. Wow. So, you know, I've, I've seen some, uh, infamous moments in, in, so Brown's we can history, blame Neil. So. <laughs> it's Neil's fault. It's Neil's <laughs> there you <fault>. go. <laughs> so, so Neil, were you in a native Clevelander that moved to the DC area? Uh, yes. So I was born in, uh, on the East side of Cleveland near Lakeshore Boulevard, 148th street. And, uh, yeah, just, been a Browns fan, Tribe fan, you know, Cavs, all of them. Just a Cleveland sports fan all the way around. So uh, when when we moved from Cleveland, we actually lived in Chicago for a little while. Then we came here to the D.C. area. And I told my kids that being a Cleveland sports fan is character building. Because you learn how to deal with frustration and loss and, you know, but you also learn the value of loyalty. So yep. true. that's what I tell well, them all the time. And it, it is funny that you say that. So like we, you know, obviously we have a podcast and we talk about the Browns nonstop. And sometimes we're hypercritical of the Browns <laughs> because we've been through this so many times and people get angry with us. And we're like, <laughs> just because I'm, I'm, Upset. Voicing my opinion and I'm upset with what's happening doesn't mean I love the Browns any less. I still love them. <laughs> I just need to get this frustration out, and now we have an outlet to do it. So, <laughs> uh, but but yeah, I mean, to your is point, there, loyalty is, is always there. 
right? As our former president once said, uh, they may question our sanity, but they'll never question our loyalty. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, uh, you know, I would argue that Browns fans in general probably have uh, some serious uh, mental fortitude. Uh, I mean, you have to. You can't root for this team without having it, right? So, um, listen, Neil, you're down there in D.C., so can you tell us, is there anything that you're, you know, what are the the local radio stations, the local sports uh, uh, talking heads saying about the commanders? Are they high on their team right now? I know they're three and one, so they got to be pretty excited, especially with the expect or lack of expectations coming into the season. Um, but, I mean, are they starting to whisper like playoffs or anything like that? What's going on down there? So uh, I think they're cautiously optimistic. Um, they're very excited about their new QB, Daniels, and, and what he's been able to do so far. Um, but they do know that they're starting a rookie. So uh, I, I think they're cautiously optimistic. But the, the wins are definitely coming early this year, and that's not usual for that team. So I think they're pretty excited. He has been impressive thus far, but I would have to imagine that everybody in that town probably has uh, vivid memories of the RG3 <laughs> success that they had and, and how that all ended. So, <laughs> And not a dissimilar yeah, yeah, style of be. quarterback. Right. <laughs> yeah. That, that's true. Yeah. And, and he's pretty aggressive. So, yeah, yep. we'll see what happens. And so with that, I mean, what are your thoughts on this game coming up here against the Commanders? Um you know, do you feel good about the Browns' chances, being that they are starting a rookie down there, um, or, or how do you see this thing kind of unfolding? Yeah, I mean, I'm nervous like I am for about every game, um, but I really think that the defense could step it up, and if they could put some pressure on Daniels, then they might be able to force him into some turnovers. Um, I think it's going to be really close, uh, so I'm hopeful for a win. Nice. And so, I mean, you say you're hopeful for a win, but I, we got to ask you, what's, what's your, what's your actual score prediction here? What do you think's going to happen? All right. I'm going to go 24 to 20 and saying the Browns offense actually comes alive and the defense gives them some turnovers and some good field position. Nice. A couple things. It's scary that 24 points is the offense coming alive. Uh, and two, I like that you're predicting well, I, Browns. I could have said 16, right? True. <laughs> That's just true. our number. Yeah. Uh, no, but uh, the other part of that was just uh, I like that you have them scoring over 20 points for the first time this season. I, yeah. I, I do appreciate it. So I guess I guess it is an offensive explosion. <laughs> um, Kenny, you had anything? Um, I was actually just curious if you had been, I've, there's been a lot of, I guess, in the news around like the stadium out there. I've seen it, the videos, I've seen uh, like the water pouring under the fans and things. Have, have you been out to that stadium at all recently? And so, is it truly in as bad a shape as uh, the media kind of paints it out to be? So I went uh, on the January 1st game when the Browns beat them last time they were here. Uh, it was beautiful weather. The, the stadium, the area it's in, there's nothing around there. So I think that's more of a complaint than the actual place itself. I mean, it is old, you know, and yes, it, it needs probably replacing or upgrading. Um, but I think it's more just the location is not near anything. So there's not a lot of restaurants or bars or anything to do around there. So I think that's why it probably ranks so low. But our seats, we were, you know, upper level, 50-yard line, and it was great. It, like, threw me back to the... Uh, even better view than the old Cleveland stadium. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So, so is there, so is there talk about rebuilding, replacing that stadium, maybe closer to like the, like the downtown area or somewhere like a social district? So yeah, they're talking about various locations. Um, I think most DC people are hopeful that they'll just take, tear down the old RFK stadium and put the new one in that area. I was at the old RFK Stadium a while back. Uh, there was a big music festival there, headlined by the Foo Fighters. Was that before or after he, he endorsed Toronto? Sorry, wrong. <laughs> it was, that was, hey, it was their it was their twenty twenty I think either twentieth or twenty fifth year anniversary, and they put on a better fireworks show than downtown DC did. So it was pretty impressive because it was on the Fourth of July. It was nice. wow. Uh, yeah, it was it was uh, I don't know four or five years ago now, and it, it was commemorating like their. 
tw- like I said, either 20 or 25 years from their first concert or whatever. So You love Foo Fighters. <laughs> I, my wife is probably their biggest fan. So <laughs> No, I was just curious about the stadium, though. Obviously, we're, we are having nonstop discussions up here uh-huh. uh, around, you know, Brook Park and what they're going to do with the stadium. But What do you think, Neil? Brook Park or downtown? I mean, it would be great if they could do downtown, but... A- I'm thinking they're going to end up doing a Brook Park. That's just seems where everything's going. Did you have a chance to see the renderings of the Brook Park model? Um, no, I didn't actually look at that. Gotcha. Yeah, it yeah. looks it looks pretty phenomenal. I mean, to the the dome that they're projecting and just kind of building a small village kind of around it that has hotels and shopping and restaurants and things. Yeah. So it looks like it would be a pretty cool place, but we'll see what they decide. Yeah, I, I think we're all on this show at least rooting for the Brook Park and new and shiny and yeah. everything good. Even the thing that people don't understand, even downtown, a lot of the bars are saying we want them to go to Brook Park because then it opens up space for the the bars downtown to be able to host people. Because right now they say it's like it's you're you're just gridlocked down there in downtown anytime there's a game. And so they say people have trouble getting to our bars. People have trouble coming in and and finding space. So they, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them would rather they go to Brook Park. So that's kind of another added bonus. It'll be interesting to see for sure. But no, so 24-20, Neil, that's what you've got this week. You got the Browns coming away with a win, uh, beating, hopefully beating up on the uh, uh, rookie quarterback there. Miles Garrett had two sacks last week. Maybe he can get another two, maybe three. Um, maybe yeah, eight yeah eight <laughs> eight yeah Be a good um number. but yeah no we hope you're right uh we hope that that comes to fruition and, and the browns come out of here one step closer to getting back to 500 but um listen neil it's been great having you we really appreciate it um as always keep up the good work down there uh with all the charities you guys work with and everything you're bringing in and uh this weekend we we're hoping for a huge huge turnout for your party for that browns backers bash I sure hope so. That'll be awesome. All right, Neil. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks so much. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. We're the Washington, D.C. area Browns Backers Club, and you're listening to Burning River Sportscast. Go Browns! Man, good time talking to Neil from the D.C. Browns backers, huh? Yeah. I shortened her name. You see, that is, is, is too long for me. <laughs> that was a long name. Yeah. That was one of the longest names, That's to be honest. The sure. Washington, D.C. area Browns backers club. Hopefully they don't. I don't hate it. And actually, this I, I think this is their main logo that's up here. Um, is pretty awesome. It is a, a dope logo. In fact, um, I was recently, I went to see my mom, and my mom had a D.C. Browns backers shirt on. I was like, Fuck you! Like she hasn't been to DC ever. <laughs> uh, apparently, my sister brought it back for her. But I, I was just, it's just funny the way this worked out because like I, like last week I was like, "Well, you were at a DC Browns Backers Club." Here. Small world, yeah. Small world. Uh, I hope they don't charge by the letter though on the print here because because uh, <laughs> it's a long name. It's a long name. Listen, Neil, we're not knocking it. We <laughs> are in all of our ventures that we've ever gotten into. We, it's kind of like the running joke is we make the longest names for everything ever. Yes, so, Neil was, um, Neil was a good conversation though. Yeah, good time. Good time. Uh, sounds like he's got a good team there. They've got a number of different locations. So if you're in the DC area, there's I like that they no shortage of places to go. They have four locations because they're like we want everybody to be somewhat close to their location so they yeah. can get out. And yeah, see they are a lot of a lot of places have like four locations because they have like 500 people. Or he's just like we're going to put people where they're making it convenient, close to your viewing location. And I love the shout out to his his site coordinators. Yeah, so. yeah, um, that's huge. I mean, uh, that's one of those things that I think too goes unnoticed sometimes with these guys is. These groups are generally led by a, a handful or less really passionate fans that volunteers yeah, is vol- basically yeah, what they volunteers are, yeah. that put their time, effort, and energy into running these groups. And uh, Neil's no exception. Yep. And so uh, let's go ahead and take a quick revenue break and then get back here and talk about the week five matchup with the Commanders. Commandos. Towpath Distillery. Towpath Distillery, an award-winning craft distillery located in Akron, Ohio. Towpath Distillery focuses on high-quality spirits carefully made in small batches. Towpath's lineup includes an ultra-smooth award-winning premium vodka, a small-batch silver rum made from the highest-grade molasses, an American craft gin made with nine botanicals, and a blended straight bourbon made from corn and rye. Towpath Distillery, now available locally and in 46 states. Visit towpath-distillery.com to place your order online or find an OHLQ retailer near you. Topat Distillery, handcrafted, award-winning, small batch, local 
and family owned. Kenny, we got an event coming up here. We do. Um, yeah, it's a trip with true fan travel to New Orleans. Now, before I talk about our trip, though, they did just uh, have a trip this past weekend to Las Vegas uh, that looked phenomenal. I don't know if you saw all those stuff being posted on social media, the video of like all the fans in the private charter flight, like waving their flat, their uh, 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 Browns towels that they got on the way out there, um, or how many Browns fans in general were in that stadium. But like this whole thing looked awesome. Um, yeah, I know. I knew it was hot there. Yeah. Um, it was a, I had, I had, I had a few friends just that were there, not even with true fan and not with true fan, but, um, I know one of them was like, it's 110 degrees outside. Yeah. And uh, like on <laughs> the asphalt <laughs> and the casino is right across the street. So like, as much as I want to go out and just drink in the sun, like I'm just going to hang out in the air conditioning yeah. for a while. So I hope that didn't like ruin their, their, their tailgate party, but I understand that it was very, very hot. Uh, you yeah. know, there were a ton of Browns fans there. I mean, they basically took over the state. The commentators even said half the stadium is Browns fans. So. Yeah. And Joe, Joe Hayden, Josh Cribbs, Bridget Linton, which Bridget Linton, uh, I don't know if you saw, she beat Joe Hayden in, uh, Quote, quote water pong uh, at their at the tailgate party. So I bet that was a blast. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so she said she was officially putting that on her resume. Quote water pong. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, they, I mean, they had an all inclusive tailgate party at Daylight Beach Club, and then the Dog Pound obviously took over Allegiant Stadium. Too bad we didn't win that game, but uh, it was awesome nonetheless. And then they actually have a trip coming up this week. Uh, their the, their trip to DC here. Um, so I mean. I'm sure that one's going to be just as awesome. Maybe not as awesome as Vegas. Vegas is pretty pretty dope, but um, I'm um, sure that's going to be a lot of fun for Browns fans this week too. So, oh yeah, you're in the nation's capital. Uh, I mean, there's again, it's, it's a different type of energy yeah. and a different yeah. type of like entertainment, but there's still a ton of things to do in DC. Oh, yeah. So I love DC. Much like we're interested in going to New Orleans for the true fan travel trip. DC has no shortage of you know, monuments and things to go check out, sightsee, parks, and all kinds of shit. So, I'm sure that if you're there, you're, there's there's gonna be plenty to do. Absolutely. And you mentioned New Orleans. That's our trip coming up. So the the trip to New Orleans, uh, the weekend of November 15th through the just before 18th. Thanksgiving. Uh, yep. Uh, that trip includes an optional round trip private charter flight, three nights stay at Renaissance New Orleans Pair Marquette French Quarter, a welcome party, which is an all inclusive cruise down the Mississippi River with the Dog Pound, Q and A with Kevin Mack. I'm sure there's autographs there as well. Pep rally the day before, all inclusive tailgate the day of. Tickets to the game at the Superdome, which is where the Super Bowl is, and on site trip coordinators to handle any questions or issues that may arise. And one thing's for sure, it won't be 110 degrees. There. No, no, it's going to be phenomenal. It should be a very mild, warm, you know, balmy, enjoyable. Like 75. Yeah, yeah about that time be, of year. So I'm really awesome. looking forward to that. I'm actually wondering now the fact that it's in close, so close proximity to Thanksgiving, if we might be delighted by some seasonal New Orleans like Thanksgiving Day treats. Like if that might be on like the uh, menu nice, for yeah. game day, you know, like yeah. uh, turkey legs and stuff. I like it. I yeah. hope so. I hope so. Uh, it's going to be pretty lit. If you haven't got your tickets, go do it now. Uh, we want you to join us in New Orleans for that party. Um, and help us take over the Superdome. Uh, but with that, let's get into the Week 5 preview brought to you by True Fan Travel. All right, so the Week 5 preview. So i got to pause you real quick. Oh, boy. I just I just having to look down while we were in the, the, average, the revenue break, and... I had like 15 text messages and usually when something like that happens like there's something bad happened or something big is it your broke. fantasy football um well it came from that group yes but the news uh which is breaking is about christian mccaffrey And it looks like he has officially been diagnosed with Achilles tendonitis in both legs. What? Which the team is it's called bilateral Achilles tendonitis. The team was very much trying to keep this under wraps. <laughs> and uh, just not good no matter how they try to spin this. They're not sure what the timetable is on his return, if he'll ever return. 
<laughs> like, Holy shit, man. He just may never be the just same. drop a bomb. Tendonitis is no, is no joke. And uh, I mean, anybody that's had uh, any sort of tendonitis knows that. Um, similar, but not exactly the same because uh, mine's uh, g- degenerative. I have tendinosis in both of my elbows. And you've had surgery on that. And I had surgery on it. And my elbow's still like nowhere near. Like I could, there's days that I legitimately, just to give you the, again, not the same thing, but but similar. Um, I, there's days I can't even hold a coffee cup because it hurts so bad. Like a coffee cup. Like this is an everyday normal thing that you do. And I can't do it on certain days because I have so much pain in my elbow. Well, that's in both of his legs now. Oh, my or Something God. similar, at least, um, that appears to not be good. Um, and again, major questions on when he will return and even if he'll be able to return at this point. So the good news for them is they found gold in that Mason kid. Um, good news for me. He's on my fantasy team. I think he's like second overall in rushing yards in yeah, the league. He's, but, he's on my fantasy team right um, now. But yeah, if you're a Christian McCaffrey owner, I mean, shoot, you're in for a rough... My uh, team's three and run right now being led by uh, Brock Purdy and and uh, Christian McCaffrey's backup. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. But, um, uh, yeah, that that seems bad. That seems bad. That's not good. Uh, but yeah, the week, Anyways. the week five preview brought to you by True Fan Travel. This week we have the Washington Commanders. Kenny, you know what it's time for, right? Oh, God, it's time for my Cliff Notes. It's time for Kenny's Cliff Notes. Time for Kenny's Cliff Notes. Oh, your own song. I like we that. Might, we might need to get a sounder stuff yeah. for this. <laughs> Uh, Any right. excuse for you to sing on the show? Uh, yeah, I did that earlier. I was feeling I was in my bag, man. Uh, all right, you were in something. <laughs> Commandos, Cliff's notes. Uh, the Browns head to the capital city, DC, if you will, to take on Dan Quinn in his first head coaching gig since he left Atlanta in 2020. Uh, let's not forget that he did give up the largest Super Bowl lead of all time, 28 to three. Never forget. <laughs> <laughs> However, yes, things, things seem to be going better for now. His team, uh, I think, is three and one here, uh, and they lead the NFC East. Uh, and with the drafting of quarterback Jaden Daniels and the addition of Cliff Kingsbury as the offensive coordinator, this team is building a formidable offense. Speaking of Jaden Daniels, was a little slow out of the gate, but has shown consistent improvement each week and is pacing what would be a rookie record if he maintains it. Not just a rookie record, an NFL record if he maintains it, completing over 80% of his passes. Jesus. Incredibly efficient, 82%. Uh, not to mention the fact that he's run for over 200 yards in his first four games, in addition to being ranked in the top 10 in pass yards. Um, his four rushing TDs rank second overall in the league, in the league, not among quarterbacks, in the league, tied with the likes of Saquon Barkley and Jonathan Taylor. For perspective, the Browns... What? <laughs> for perspective, the what? Browns... <laughs> for perspective, the Browns have two as a team. <laughs> oh, my God. So this kid has the makings of an absolute star in the league if... He stays healthy and continues to improve. You know who called this? Uh, a lot of people said he was going to be better than Caleb Williams. No, but like, like went hard on it and was like, no, the, the guy it, that everybody should be looking at in the draft, they're not looking at. And it was uh, Kirk Herbstreet, actually. Yeah. Had a huge, uh, big, long segment on uh, one of the shows uh, leading up to the draft. And he's like, Jaden Daniels is going <laughs> to be the steal of the draft. Yeah. And, I, and I, he wasn't alone. I mean, I heard a lot of people say the same thing. It's almost like that first pick is more, you're almost more hamstrung at one than you are if you're in just the top five. Yeah. Because if you're in the top five, you can kind of get away with whoever falls or you can move up if you really want to get a guy. You can always fall back when it doesn't go right. You say, ah, he's. But if you're number we one, like to. you it's... have to take the consensus number yeah. one guy, right? Yeah. You can't not. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, jury's still out on Caleb Williams. They're winning games in Chicago a little. Um, he's <laughs> not like he's not looked very good la- of late, but he's you know he's there, and I think he's a huge bust. Um, but... We'll see what happens. I mean, yeah. he hasn't thrown for a whole lot of yards or anything. But anyways, uh, back to our Cliff's notes here. Uh, Jane Daniels, absolute stud. Um, Two very serviceable running backs in Brian Robinson Jr., who's currently 10th in the league in rushing yards, and Austin Eckler, although Eckler is uh, battling injury right now. When isn't he, hasn't he been battling injury in his uh, Yeah, it's kind of a thing for him. But uh, when he's on the field, he can be electric. Um, arguably the most dangerous part of their team, the wide receiver room led by a pair of Ohio State Buckeyes in 
Gary, Terry McLaurin, and Noah Brown. Uh, they also added an NFL uh, royal family uh, member in Luke McCaffrey, who we just talked about his brother uh, in the draft. And Can, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, uh, it's, not, if, it's if, not genetic. If Christian McCaffrey has to retire, he can transfer his talent to his brother. Yeah, yeah, just like knight him, Sir Luke, Sir uh, Luke <laughs> McCaffrey. And uh, oh yeah, they still have Jameson Crowder, who doesn't suck. Um, and the wily vet Zach Ertz at tight end. Uh, <laughs> Zach so. Ertz. He's old, but he's good. Um, His ball Zach Ertz. <laughs> mostly remade offensive line, anchored by third round pick left tackle Brandon Coleman and Nick Allegretti, who was a fill in for the Chiefs a year ago when Joe, Joe Thune went down. He played in 12 or 13 games for them and played in the Super Bowl uh, there as well. And Tyler Biadaz coming over from the Cowboys. Uh, this uh, was among one of the worst. Offensive lines a year ago, expectations really weren't that high for this group coming into the season. Uh, But I would say they've performed, uh, overperformed to this point, uh, given that they've only given up nine sacks in four games and have a third-ranked rushing attack at 169 yards per game. On the defensive side, uh, Farrell, Payne, Allen, all three former first-round picks across that defensive line. Oh, and a guy that I didn't mention, Dorrance Armstrong had one and a half sacks last week in a blowout win over the highly ranked Arizona offense. And lest us not forget, Bobby Wagner, former Utah State product, uh, has played forever in Seattle in his first year with the Commandos, coming off of what was essentially his best season in his career, which he led the league in tackles 183 a year ago. So at 34 years that, that's, young. That's, that's tough. That is <laughs> the big number. Whoa. <laughs> the 34 years young dude is still a force to be reckoned with. You'll hear his name a lot on Sunday as he will be wherever the play is because he averages 10 tackles a game. So That's why. <laughs> um, not a lot to be scared of in their secondary, but it is a group of young veterans. I mean, anyways, what does that mean? Uh, it's a lot of guys that have played for three or four years in the league so they've seen a lot of football still in their prime um with the exception of this year's second round pick corner mike sanistrill hmm. uh from that team up north if you remember picked off mike Penix in the national championship game almost took it to the house but that basically iced the game from michigan with like four minutes left uh, and finally, in special teams, the kicker has been a revolving door for the commandos. But the man of the moment is former Brown, Austin Seibert. And they do have a- Who took over for the former <laughs> for man of the moment, Brown. former Brown. Kate K- York. Yeah. And they do have a solid punter in Tressway who can help them flip the field when necessary. Yeah, and so that'll do it for Kenny's Cliff Notes, and we'll get into Ronnie Jam's matchups that matter. <laughs> um all right, I guess we both need sounders now. More, more sounders, the better. Yeah, uh, so f- matchup that matters, number one, Deshaun Watson versus the Commanders secondary. The Commanders have the 29th ranked defense overall and the 31st ranked passing defense. Uh, not to be outdone, the Browns have the 30th ranked passing offense. So... <laughs> I don't know what that means. I just know it's going to be interesting to see who comes out on top on that one. Let's just say the last part again. Sorry. So the commanders have 29th ranked defense overall, the 31st ranked passing defense, and the Browns have the 30th ranked passing offense. Yes, 30th ranked passing offense. That's but it. we do have a silver lining for the Browns is they – potentially have David and Joe coming back this week. Yeah, that's a silver lining. You want to hear what's not a silver lining? Sure. Um, <laughs> the fact that uh, if you look at – Quarterback um, pass attempts after four weeks. Second in the league is Deshaun Watson. Oh, he moved up one. He moved up one. Uh, we love number one. The ball. Number one is Dak Prescott at one forty nine. Deshaun's at one forty eight. <laughs> pass yards. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. There's. One guy in the league with less pass yards than Deshaun Watson. So he's second most passing attempts, second least passing yards. Yes. Do you know who that guy is? Uh, probably Bo Nix. Bo Nix, because he threw for 60 yards this <laughs> week. That's, that's the guy our quarterback's better than. He has the second most pass attempts in the league and the second least amount of yards. So all that equates to a 30th ranked offense. This is fine. <laughs> this is fine. Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, uh, we could 
talk about this all day, but uh, juxtaposition. Yeah, that's uh, the word. Yeah, that's it. Uh, <laughs> I just, it just amazes me how, like, fiercely his supporters, oh. uh, like, like fight anybody who yeah. says anything critical of him when it's just written everywhere right now. Like. Literally any evidence you look at, regardless of how poorly the team's playing as a whole, he's not good. Not good. He's not good. Not good at all. He's not good. It's really bad. Uh, really bad. I digress because I don't want to get into this again. But <laughs> uh, next matchup that matters here, the Browns front seven versus the Commanders O-line. Uh, the Commanders have the fifth best rushing attack, as you mentioned. Um, and the Browns just gave up 152 yards to the worst rush attack in the NFL. So, so you're telling me there's a chance. So there's that. <laughs> um, so it's, I mean, if they can't stop the run, it's over regardless. Um, so in summary here, the, the team, uh, the commanders have a three and one record. Uh, they're coming off a beat down of the Arizona Cardinals, 42 to 14 that we mentioned earlier. This is a solid team. They have something brewing in, in uh, Jaden Daniels. He's he's a good player. Um, the defense isn't great, though, if there's one uh, kind of downside to this team. Uh, they're giving up 29.3 points per game, but the Browns can't score 20, so there's that. Um, and on the flip side of things, the Browns have a 1-3 record, coming off a devastating loss to the Raiders. And uh, this, this was one of the worst feeling losses that I can remember. And the Cowboys game was only three weeks ago. <laughs> and the Giants game was last week. Um, so, you know, they've, they've played poorly literally everywhere on the field all season long. And it, it extends to coaching as well. And as of right now, uh, this team is still one of the worst in the league. And they probably need a miracle to win. Uh, well put. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, with that, Kenny, you got any betting info for us? I do. The line for this week is Commanders, the favorite, minus three. Uh, minus three, three and a half, some betting books, but the uh, FanDuel had minus three. Uh, over under at 43 and a half. So they do expect more points to be scored this week. My guess is that the Commanders will so score them. on their side. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Probably. Uh, but that'll take us to the injury report. What do you got for us for the injury? Yeah, I got some injuries here. Uh, <laughs> Probably a lot of them for the Browns. Yeah. Start with them because it takes like, it adds like 45 minutes to our podcast. I was just going to say, I was going to go through the Redskins first, the Commanders first, because uh, there's just not that many. Um, so right now, Clellan Farrell, defensive end, as uh, listed, is out. Eckler, like I said, still battling uh, a, a concussion, and I think it was, what did they call it, an ear laceration. Um, he got popped pretty good. Um, Jameson Crowder also listed as out at the moment. Um, uh, real quick, the Detroit Lions helmets are fire. Uh, yeah, the the uh, metallic blue. Yeah, those are dope. Yeah, ass. pretty sick. Sorry, go on. Um, speaking of helmets, you see the Atlanta Falcons wore the old old schools this week with the red helmet and the old Falcon that was our Falcon from our high school Field days. Field Falcons. Um, but yeah. they caught a lot of flack on social media this week because if you look at the helmet that's on, the yellow Falcon that's on the helmet, there's a white outline around the Falcon. They posted like a teaser like, oh, we're doing throwbacks this weekend on Facebook. Uh, or on social media, and uh, the outline, the white outline was removed. So picture this, the black falcon on a red background. Like, what does that look like? It looks like Nazi war memorabilia. <laughs> <laughs> People were like... Whoa. My mind doesn't go there because I'm not a fan of the Nazis. So. <laughs> they were like, what in the Reich is going on? Um, <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> but, so, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> they deleted a bunch of those. Uh, anyway, back to the injury report. Um, Nick Allegretti, guard questionable. Um, he did leave Sunday's game uh, with an ankle uh, against the Cardinals and did not return. Tyler Owens, safety, um, is questionable as well. Um Marcus Mariota is like their fourth string quarterback. They're one of the few teams that has four quarterbacks on their active roster, but he is on the injured reserve. Uh, and that pretty much runs the injury report for the commanders. And now for the Browns. Oh, man. If you hey, guys, at, just strap in. It's going to be a long one. If you look at this thing, like just, just don't even tell us what's happening. Just go through them and just say the names of the people that aren't playing. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> David and Joku listed currently is out. 
Well, um, it hasn't updated from from the game. So yeah, I mean. Well, so so he's listed out, but the note is that Kevin Stefanski said he expects Njoku to get back on the practice field this week. Uh, Naheem Hines out, expected to be designated to return from non-football injury this week. Uh, Jordan Hicks, questionable elbow injury. Ethan Pochick, uh, considered day-to-day with an ankle. Nick Chubb, uh, you know, we know his deal. Uh, Jed Wills out, Pierre Strong out, Jack Conklin out, Wyatt Teller injured reserve. Was Jack Conklin and Jed Wills, I'm assuming we might get back because they both... uh uh, well, maybe not. I, mean, I guess uh, we sh- we're hoping we get them back at some point. Yeah, Jed Wills just got a new injury last week, so yeah. yeah so who uh, knows? Who knows? We who, don't have an offensive who, line. We don't need it. Who knows? We suck either way. And, and again, still a bunch of dudes on IR: Mo Hurst, uh, Miles Harden, uh, Tony Fields, Diabati, Thornhill, Michael Dunn. All down the list. Um, and then our good friend Mike Hall still out on the commissioner's exempt list. So we'll see what happens there. Fun. Yeah, so like if you just look at their their depth <laughs> chart and you just on like like half of it is red. <laughs> it's just wild. I, these last two years, I mean, I, I we kind of in, in uh, preseason talked about like get out of here with this. All their their whole, but maybe their strength and conditioning coaches do need fired because literally everyone's hurt all the time. Everyone's hurt all the time. All the time. Might just be that Northeast Ohio weather. Maybe. Uh, but with that, let's uh, get into our players to watch. Um, uh, we'll, we'll go with Bone first since he's not here. Um, Bone phoned in Zadarius Smith. My mom just texted me. Oh, no, Pete Rose died. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Bone phoned in uh, Zadarius Smith for his player to watch, uh, which is probably a good one seeing as they have a really good rush defense and we've got a really bad rush – or they've got a really good rush offense and we've got a really bad rush defense. So, uh, yeah, I'd agree. As he probably needs to help with that. And then <laughs> he probably needs to help with that. <laughs> <laughs> and hopefully he can get after the quarterback and free, uh, if nothing else, disrupt and free Miles Garrett up to get another sack or two. So – yeah. Um, I'll go next. Um, I've got Dustin Hopkins. D Hop. Don't know what's going on with him. Um, he missed an extra point last week. Uh, so now he's missed a, a kick and an extra point this season. Um, I, I don't know if it was a spite miss because Kevin Stefanski didn't give him a chance to kick the 56 yarder after he had already, or I'm sorry, the. Yeah, the 56-yarder after he'd already hit a 53-yarder. That I don't know. He had like 12 more yards to go in that thing, and and he still would have made it, and they didn't even give him a shot. So maybe it was spite, and he was like, here, I'll miss this extra point then. Uh, but yeah, either way, he's missed a couple kicks. So um, and that missed extra point arguably cost us that game. So Yeah, very well. I mean, the fact that they didn't kick the field goal. Yeah, I, we were in field also, goal range, so also didn't help. I mean, yeah, yeah. all of those things. If so. it was 20 to 19 there or 20 to 18 there. Yeah, and so I, I just think that if he misses another kick this week that may be the difference in the game. Um, especially with how hard it is for the Browns to come by points. Yeah. So can't be missing kicks. Dustin Hopkins, my player to watch. Kenny, who you got? Um, yeah, I agree there on D hop. I, it's, it's like I said last night on the, on the live show. I just think that this team has reached team apathy. They just, there's just nobody that is, is focused the way that they should be. Yeah. Um, cause it's not like Dustin Hopkins is bad or forgot how to kick. Like he's still probably one of the best kickers in the league. Yeah. Um, it's just like when everything is going bad, like, Everything goes bad. Uh, so my player to watch this week, when uh, the chips are down and you're in the midst of adversity and your locker room is in question, your coaches are in question, basically everything. I mean, when you're one and three, you start to question everything, right? Uh, to me, that's... Uh, the time you look to your leaders. Uh, a guy like Miles Garrett has to show up this week and has to show up big. Everybody's looking at that guy, right? I mean, you watch <laughs> What did him. we say earlier in the show? Three, four, five, six, <laughs> seven, eight sacks? I think it's going to take a day like that, though, with Jaden Daniels running around back there. I mean, you have to. He, he is a rookie, and a guy like Miles needs to remind him of that. He needs to make, he needs to force the issue, make him make bad decisions, make him force throws and put him in the dirt. Yeah. That's how you beat a rookie quarterback. You put well, especially him in the dirt. that's how you get a rookie quarterback. Who's mobile like that to stop running around. Yeah. Yeah. You say, Miles well, every time you run around, you times. get punished. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I know that is kind of a cop out pick because it's Miles Garrett. But honestly, like I, I think that like, 
the team right now is looking for leadership and accountability. Miles is the guy that has to deliver that because he's the best player on that defense, yeah. period. Absolutely. And speaking of the defense for the Browns, um, obviously we've talked about it today. They've struggled a lot. So I want to bring in somebody uh, that could, can speak to that, that's been on the field for the Cleveland Browns. They can speak to the struggles the defense is having. Um, so with that, let's, let's, let's talk to our buddy, John Hughes. John Hughes. Powered by Riverside FM. All right, guys, please help me welcome former Browns DT, our official defensive correspondent and friend of the show, John Hughes. Hey, John. John, Hughes. John, what's hey, up, man? You, guys. Thank you. What's going on, guys? How are we doing today? Good, good. How have things been with you lately? Uh, pretty good, man. I can't complain. It's been, uh, you can't complain during football season, right? Uh, I mean, if you're a Browns fan, you can. <laughs> uh, we'll get to that, John. <laughs> <laughs> we're, still watching, we're still watching a lot of football, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, so uh, before we get into anything Browns related, um, I know recently there was a huge, huge milestone in your life. You scored your first touchdown at Huntington Bank Field. So can you tell us how that felt? Yeah, man, it felt pretty good, man. I felt like I was back in my, my tight end days in high school, man. I haven't caught a touchdown pass since uh, 2007. So it was, <laughs> it was pretty good to get back there out there on the field and catch the rock. <laughs> And it was a sellout at, at uh, Cleveland Brown Stadium that 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 week, wasn't it? I think they yeah, sold the it, stadium it, out. it felt like it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, what, what's our what's our capacity, Kenny? Uh, I think seventy three thousand or so. Whatever it was, yeah. You felt every every bit of it, huh, John? <laughs> oh yeah, most most definitely, man. It was a a, a quick slant on my on my touchdown, man. I I, I thought I was gonna uh, try to try to get loose a little bit, man, but it was it was fun. <laughs> Listen, I saw the dudes they tried it out for that game. I'm pretty sure you could beat most of them in a foot race. For sure. And just beat them up. <laughs> hey, so hey, quick, real quick, man. It was funny. We uh, Before we came out, uh, they told us right before we came out, they were like, hey, you guys can't wear cleats. And we're like, what? This, this is the first time I ever played football without cleats on, right? <laughs> so the only guy that got to that uh, put his cleats on and didn't change was Hawk, right? The, the, the only guy that probably didn't need cleats out there anyway. And he yeah. just run all over the place, man. I remember there was one play where he was running to the side and he cut back hard and I was running towards him. I was like, I got to make a business decision. <laughs> and, and he just <laughs> ran right past me, man. He was running all over the place. <laughs> oh, man. He would. He would. So did your team end up winning that thing, John? Yeah, yeah. We, we ended up getting the dub, man. It, it's, it's funny because uh, – it was going so fast, you know, it was quick as 10 minutes. Um, I, I thought the score was tied, but, you know, if they said we won, we won, right? That's yeah. right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never walk away from a W. Yeah. No. Hey, we, we took the trophy in the locker room. That's all that mattered. <laughs> Absolutely. So let's, you know, let's let's get into the Browns here. We try, you know. Uh, yeah, enough with the pleasantry. What the hell is going on with this football team? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, Man. you know. Listen, John, uh, John, being our defensive correspondent, specifically on defense, you know, last year uh, uh, we the defense was was they humming were, all they season were the long. Defense. Yeah, like like yeah. Jim Schwartz had them playing very good football, and so far in these first uh, four weeks, it's been just night and day. It's been awful. So, can you tell us kind of what you're seeing and what seems to be the issue? Yeah, I feel like a lot of times, um, especially with how good our defense was uh, last year, we expect just them to start from where they, they, they left off at and just keep playing like that. But I feel like this team, uh, this defense, uh, has some work to do uh, together. You know what I mean? Um, and, and first, I would say, starting with the run, um, that yeah, as a defense alignment, I used to pride myself on the run. And right now we're giving up over 120 yards a game. So I, I think, you know, uh, being able to stop the run in the beginning is really going to help kind of set the tone uh, for the defense. I, I think, uh, you know, the fact that we're giving up that amount of rushing yards and we just played the worst rushing attack in the entire right. league and we mm -hmm. gave them 153, I think it was. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard to win football games right. when, you're, when you're that poor. Well, and then when you think about the pass rush we have up front, right, uh, we always like to say, you know, in order to uh, to uh, rush the passer, you got to stop the run, right? You got to uh, uh, take one dimension out to make it the one dimension, right? So when they're sitting there running the ball and they're 
productive and effective, why would you stop at that point? You know what I mean? So being able to yeah. stop the run, earn the right to rush the passer. Hey, John, let me ask you, I mean, as a defensive lineman and, and you're kind of like pre-snap, you're reading your keys, you have, you obviously have a play call in. I mean, how confident mm-hmm. are you? Obviously, again, you've watched film all week on these guys. Like, how confident are you that a run's coming? Like, you're looking at splits, I, I would assume, and there's different splits for pass versus run protections and things. Like, are you pretty well certain, like, in a lot of cases when you know a run's coming your way? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's it's breaking it down, either run or pass first, right? And then you want to understand all right, what kind of run, what are the odds of the runs that I'm going to get towards me or away from me, you know, vice versa. And that comes with the splits, um, the the different sets you get from the wings, the tight ends, and the backs. Um, but, yeah, you, you have a pretty good feeling of what's coming for the most part. Obviously, you said go, go, go out there and play football, right? But uh, at the end of the day, there are a lot of, you know, keys that give you um, good ideas of where, where the ball is going. Yeah, and I, I would assume that, I mean, it, it seems, I, I I'm assuming that, you know, they're doing all the prep work and so they know all those things going into it. I mean, do you think mm-hmm. that maybe part of this is just like preseason hangover starters not playing a lot in the preseason and just not getting that time to just, just feel the game? Like what's, it just feels like it's so night and day from last year. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like it's, it could be a lot of different things. Um, but really, it's just, you know, the guys coming together. I, and, and, I, and obviously, I've been in the locker room uh, a lot of uh, different uh, games after, you know, losses like that, right? And it's really just the guys coming together, um, you know, having that not quit mentality and, and, you know, strapping them up and going to practice the next day and figuring it out, right? Because um, obviously, you know, we, we still only played four games, still got a lot of season left to go. Um, but figuring it out sooner than later is going to help us out. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, and I know, uh, you know, obviously you, we just talked about it. You were in, uh, at the stadium not too long ago, um, mm-hmm. for, for alumni weekend and doing the flag football game at halftime. So I'm sure, uh, at some point, and, and, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but you probably at least have met Jim, Jim Schwartz and, and talked to him a little bit. How furious is he that this defense is playing the way he is? Do you think? I can only imagine. Um, it's, it's one of it's one of those things, right? Um, as a defensive uh, coach, man, you obviously you you prepped, you got your guys ready to go for the week, and um, and and the and the game doesn't go as you expect or as you want, right? But um, at the end of the day, you're still going to go out and, and and do what you have to do. And I, and I think, like I said, beginning, it's it's got a lot of football to go, so just uh, kind of you know keep preparing and keep uh, prepping. Obviously, there's going to be changes, um, you know, that they're going to have to make adjustments. But um, at the end of the day, yeah. And, you know, know John, during your tenure with the Browns, they didn't necessarily have a Mm -hmm. ton of success every year. Um, I mean, how difficult is that when you walk into a locker room at, you know, one and three, just to kind of keep the team together this early in the season? Um, You think of the positives, right? Um, Right after this game, you know, I was, was, you know, pretty, pretty upset like every other Brown fan. Right. But then I kind of put everything in perspective. I'm like, well. We haven't played a division game yet, right? So we're still 0-0 in the division. We're still, you know what I mean? And last time I checked, the winner of the division gets, gets, a, gets, a, gets a, a shot in the playoffs. So I like where your head's at. Yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's the most yeah. hopeful I've felt since yesterday. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it's a little shot in the arm. A little shot in the arm. Not to yeah. mention, I mean, I, yeah, and obviously, uh, you know, we'll talk about it more on the show today, but, uh, you got Najoku coming back on the offensive side. Mm-hmm. And I know, I know you're our defensive, uh, correspondent, but we got Najoku coming back on the offensive side. You got Nick Chubb, uh, getting closer. He's not, probably not quite there yet, but he's getting closer. So there is some things to, to at least linings. look forward to here. Um, but on the defense, back to the defensive side of the ball, how do we, how does the team fix this besides just, uh, you know, coming together as a team? Is there anything specifically that they can do to, to right the ship here? Um, kind of what I've just been seeing overall, um, you know, g- getting off the field when you need to, right? Um, uh, when you're on defense, you're trying to obviously get off the field, right? So when you get uh, the team behind the sticks, um, giving up those, you know, those big runs, those big, catches for the first down, you know, it's a, it's a morale kind of uh, breaker for, for the, for the defense, you know, the guys that have been out there for, you know, five, 10 plays. Um, but at the same time is you're giving your offense less, less time on the field too. And it's the game of possessions at the end of the day. Right. So you want to be able to give your, your offense the ball as much as possible. Absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I would think so. Just thinking like the opposite of that too, John. I mean, when the offense continues to go three and out, and that defense is just on the field 
for what seems like forever. I mean, how frustrating is mm-hmm. that for a defensive player? Yeah, it, it can definitely get frustrating. Um, but we always try to, you know, look at the glass half full. I'm like, well, I get more TV time now. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> it's, it's one of those. Things. I never, <laughs> and, I never you know, I've never played in the right. NFL, so I never thought of that as like a factor. But I'm like, you know what? You're right. Yeah, you're probably like, yeah, people will be watching me more now. Uh, yeah, I mean, because that's, that's the end of the day. Good. You're not you're not going to be. When when guys are you know complaining about not wanting to you know or they get mad about the turnovers yeah they're mad that the offense you know turn the ball over but it shouldn't be because they have to go back on the field right it's it's the it's the fact that you know we lost an opportunity to score pretty much right Fair right enough. and now, you, you, know. you mentioned one of the big keys to a turnaround is probably getting off the field on third downs uh, this week we have Jaden mm-hmm. Daniels. Uh, and he's, you know, he's a very mobile quarterback. Uh, he's come on quickly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he seems to be handling defenses and reading defenses fairly well, uh, especially for a rookie. So what sort of strain does a mobile quarterback like that put on our defense? Um, well, I feel like, you know, the biggest thing with a mobile quarterback is being able to contain, right? Um, the last thing you want are three different options now, right? Now you have to worry about a run, a pass, or the quarterback, keeping it running, you know, after he gets space. Right. So being able to keep him contained, but honestly, I, I love our upfront. I love our guys up front. I, I feel like we're going to rush the passer and we're going to get to him. Right. Um, I feel like there hasn't really been a mobile quarterback that's really gotten away from us. You know what I mean? It, it's, it's like, yeah, we, we come up with him. Uh, we have a mobile quarterback, you know, that you talk about Lamar's and the different guys, but I feel like our defensive line and, um, and our, and our secondary and our backers, man, I feel like we do well against uh, running quarterbacks either way. Lamar is actually a perfect example because the past couple of years he hasn't uh, torched the Browns at all uh, with his legs. So. Except for the time he had diarrhea and came back and like, <laughs> half and beat us. <laughs> More he had to run to walk and come back. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I think even that game, I'm pretty sure it was mostly with his arm. It wasn't with his legs. Uh, um, but anyways, yeah. uh, listen, John. Uh, Obviously, we're going to do this to you. What do you think the score to the game this week is going to be? Who's going to win, and what's the score going to be? Oof. Well, obviously, no Browns are going to win. Um, <laughs> I say we. I, I say I say we'll be at seventeen seven. We might we might let we might let one go, but we'll, we'll get it done on offense this week. Nice. Uh, it's, it's, so seventeen. We're still not. Well, hitting you that. guys can just ask me. What, what, what do you guys think? What you guys got? <laughs> oh, ours is in a, ours is in our King of the North segment, but I. Uh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I listen for them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We. Uh, yeah. It's going to be interesting because I know there's some some differing takes here. Probably so. not as optimistic as, as your take was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what, that's what we'll say for now. Uh, but it'll it'll be yeah. on there. So so check that out. Um, we'll send it directly to you, John. <laughs> Oh, please. So, please do. Let me, John, <laughs> let me ask you this. Which which side of the ball gets it figured out first? Do you think this defense comes together and starts playing like the defense they were last year? Or do you think this offense is, is going to figure this thing out? Because the offense has been as difficult as, it, as the defense has had it. The offense has been probably way worse. So, mm-hmm. I, I, I feel like um, both sides are going to figure it out. But I feel like as a defensive guy, I want to say defense just because – you know, as especially as a defensive lineman, having getting getting the ball ran on you like that, it's it's you take that personal with a chip on your shoulder. You take that in the next week, so I feel like we're going to see a lot a lot different play coming up. Awesome. Nice. Well, hey John, it's mm-hmm. been great having you on. We really really appreciate your time. Um, once again, just all around good dude. Got the, uh, got the best hair in the got business. the best hair in the game. <laughs> Former Browns defensive dude. tackle. Our defense, our official defensive correspondent and all-around friend of the show. John, thank you oh, so yeah. much for joining us. We John appreciate Hughes. it. Appreciate you guys. Man, it was awesome talking to John Hughes, huh? I, I love John Hughes. Just one of the best guys. Um, not to mention, I mean, just the fact that he's an ex football player, next Brown. I mean, plus look how good he looks. Yeah, and his hair, man, it gets, it gets better and better every time yeah. we talk to him. He's he knows he's, he's a stylish dude. Uh, but you know what we're ready for? 
Uh, I hope it's gassed up. Yeah, well, it's time to get gassed up. I'm pretty gassed up right now. All right, it's time to get gassed up. Bone's not going to get gassed up this week because he's not here. We're boneless. <laughs> We're boneless. So uh, I'm going to go first. Uh, I'm boneless, ga- but not spineless. I'm gassed up about uninsured drivers. Uh, if you're an uninsured driver out there, like I know people <laughs> fall on hard times, That's but <laughs> yeah. But seriously, though, like I'm not trying to say like you're a terrible person. I understand that people do fall on hard times financially um, and things happen. But here's the deal. You're car insurance, if you're using a car to get around, your car insurance should be one of the top priorities for you. Um, Because you just, if you hit somebody who has insurance and is doing the right things um, and you don't have insurance, then their insurance pays for this. So I don't know if anybody knows how this works or not because you're not paying for insurance, so you might not know. Um, But so now the person who got hit that has insurance, their insurance will pay out on the claim. Their insurance rates will go up. They'll pay more over time. Um, And it's at no fault of their own. They did everything they were supposed to. They've been paying on their car insurance. Um, And and here comes the guy that that decided to let his lapse and uh, rear ends you and uh, causes all kinds of problems. Uh, You have to get your car fixed or get a new car if it's totaled. Um, All the insurance issues I just mentioned, like it's just a headache. And to me, it's just so inconsiderate of like other people. Like, forget about the whole fact that it's the law. Uh, it's just so inconsiderate to drive around with no insurance, knowing that if I hit somebody, it's on them. I mean, you should at least have basic like liability coverage, right? Right, and, and you and, can get that from the general for like next to nothing. Yeah, and and I I get it. Like, like I said, I get it. Like stuff happens, but that needs to be one of the top priorities. Um, for example, if you have, if you're, you're having medical issues and you have a bunch of medical bills, um, this is just an example. It may or may not be from personal experience that this is all, uh, b- stemming from, but, um, if you've got medical issues and you have medical bills that have piled up, you need to pay your car insurance first because your medical bills are one of those things where you can pay those over time. Like there's a lot of built in leeway because they're medical bills and you can't be refused treatment and all of that stuff when you go to a facility. So like pay your car insurance is what I'm trying to say. Like the fact that, well, you shouldn't be driving without it. Yeah. Period. So I'm, I'm really going to start getting like, I'm just going to start yelling if yeah, I keep I getting into this. I think you're being overly nice because <laughs> There's a lot of people that drive around without car insurance that run into you on the way to the Outback. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, if you can afford a $30 stake, you can afford liability. Yeah. Well, if you can afford gas these days, you should be able to afford your, <laughs> yeah. your $30 liability. Like, it's insane. And, and again, like, I, there's, there's financial as far as ha- the other person having to pay their more insurance. There's the time commitment of uh, fixing everything, uh, whether it be fixed or you get a new car. There's the the injury p- uh, part of it where, like, just every, literally everything. Just, just fuck you if you don't have insurance. Like, seriously. <laughs> I think it just speaks to, like, the irresponsible entitlement God. that, like, people have that they just think, like, they're, like, like, like driving is a right yeah, like it's 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 not. It's a legalized privilege. And, and let me just say this: if you're going two to three miles per hour, there's no way that you can rear end my wife and total her car. <laughs> so no, probably not. <laughs> yeah, just get the fuck out of here, <laughs> Kenny. What are you gassed up about? Uh, well, it's not so serious as uninsured drivers, but um, I was I've been gassed up for a whole week about this. Ooh, that uh, sounds serious. <laughs> It gasses me up every time it happens to me. Um, You're often gassed up. If I were to ask you, <laughs> if, I'm a gassy guy. <laughs> if I were to ask you, let's just take fast food restaurant A. Okay. And I would say, what's in a meal at fast food restaurant A? Burger, fries, drink. Burger, fries, drink. Like, pretty simple, right? Like, not a lot of, like, demystifying needs to happen there. No, nah, like, if you're going if you're going B, though, it's... Tacos side drink. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about we're going A. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so A, burger, fries, drink. So I'm getting in the minute drive through at the Golden Arches, and I ask what I've ordered at McDonald's for basically every order of my entire life, which is 
a double cheeseburger meal. This happens from time to time. I don't know why. I don't know if it's an update to their point of sale software or their menu, whatever the issue is. But the response I get back is, we don't have a double cheeseburger meal. So make one. <laughs> she goes, like it's not hard. Just make one. She goes, well, I can get you this $5 meal deal we have, but instead of a double cheeseburger, it comes with a McDouble. Would you want Ain't that? nobody want a goddamn McDouble. <laughs> like, let's just stop here. I'm gassed up again because they rolled out the, the McDouble when we were in high school, and it was the biggest piece of shit thing that's ever happened at McDonald's I've because still never they're one. so, so damn cheap that they realized if we start selling a freaking McDouble, <laughs> we're going to save millions yeah. because we save a piece of cheese yeah. on every sandwich go no fuck you mcdonald's yeah, <laughs> yeah my sentiments exactly. mcdouble can can go to hell so essentially like she asks me if i want this meal deal with a mcdouble and i was like did i order a mcdouble <laughs> like, no i ordered a double cheeseburger um i understand it may not be a pretty button on your computer but like if you go in your mind like couldn't you go you know sir i apologize we don't have an actual meal for that but i, I uh, i'm gonna ring you in a, a Coke and a fry with a double cheeseburger. $15 an hour for, I don't know where that button is. <laughs> and the thing is, like, why is there not just a meal button at McDonald's, right? Like, I should be well, able to Well, again, order- I just go back to, so make it, like, okay, if there's not a double cheeseburger meal button, just click double cheeseburger, fries, drink. Well, that's what I mean, right? Not just, hard. Just, just click the buttons. <laughs> but, like, but, like, there should just be a meal button, too, right? Like, if I just was, like... Like I, I don't know if there's anything that's not on the menu. Like ordering anything, a, it just ordering it just adds fries, fries and a drink. A, yeah, you just order fries and a and drink. Guess what? You should cost. have three of them. You should have a medium, a large, and a super size or whatever it is. So yeah. like, like why is that? Go. Why is that not an option on like McDonald's's intuitive like PO, POS system for their employees? But the thing is, the thing that really gasses me up though is the fact that like it's not every McDonald's. It's just random McDonald's's because. 85% of the McDonald's I've ever been to in the world are like double cheeseburger meal. Yeah, sure. That's like a very normal order. People like a double cheeseburger. Of course it is. They want their fries and their Coke. Like, this, I'm not like making things up. I'm not like, give me the super McFish fry. Like, <laughs> like I'm ordering a double cheeseburger. Give me the McGangbang. Yeah, I want the McGangbang. <laughs> I want the double cheeseburger meal. And most of the time it's fine. So it, so when they tell me, when they stop me to tell me, well, that's, we don't have, technically have that. That really just pisses me off. Because I'm like, first off, then just ring it in as you would any other meal and don't tell me about it or <laughs> like the fuck like I don't want because guess what I'm not even going to check I'm just going to eat my food <laughs> yes, just give me what I order god so that yeah. is a good one you so, got me gassed up on the McDouble <laughs> McDouble is the bane to everybody's existence I like, just don't understand like why even McDonald's would create a menu without a double cheeseburger meal in general like, idiots why You're so stupid and the thing was and you think and you know the thing was honestly is so then I was just like, because <laughs> I had to solve the problem. I had to be like, okay, well, I don't want the McDouble. I, <laughs> you're all about solving problems when everybody else has them. You're like, you're like, let me walk you through this. Like, cause like, you're too stupid to figure this out. Let me do it for you. <laughs> to be like, I've seen this a number of times in your life. <laughs> Okay, then I'll have a double cheeseburger, a large fry, and a large Coke. And then, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It's so just she rings it in. But the thing was, is honestly, I think I ended up being charged like 10 50 for that. Like my fries and Coke were like, I don't know, like an enormous amount. Like, I think if I would have done the $5 meal deal, thing that she offered me and I could have just got two the, of them oh well, I could have ordered the McDouble <laughs> with an extra piece of cheese I think an extra piece of cheese is 49 cents so like I probably just screwed myself over and I was instead, it's of, the principle. instead of 549 I paid 10 dollars so that I could have what I wanted to eat it's the principle of it <laughs> but I'm just it's just so stupid why why yeah, is this why is that a thing man. McDonald's no, why no, no, that's stupid all right let's let's quit getting gassed up let's take this to the king of the north <laughs> Okay, so in case anyone doesn't know by now, this is our year-long AFC North Pick'em competition. At the end of the season, whoever comes in last place gets punished. At the end of the season, uh, at the end, of, bleh, in the preseason last year, Kenny had a gross of eggs thrown at him by fans in the Muni lot before a game. Kenny, how was that? Miserable. 
In the preseason this year, Kenny had his entire head and beard shaved clean off. I looked. At <laughs> I said your head was shaved off. <laughs> no like, way. Peyton, like Peyton Manning <laughs> when I cut his head off and put it back on. Uh, his hair and beard was shaved clean off. Wow. I looked like a neo-Nazi for a straight week. Yeah. You did uh, donate a lot of hair, though, so I good did. on you. Yeah. Thanks, good job, buddy. Uh, and your hair was nice, too. N- uh, wig maker's probably so excited. So, somebody's excited. They got 20 inches of hair. <laughs> uh, punishment this season will be you have to go to a public pool, get in said pool, and then publicly announce that you have peed in the pool. People are not going to be happy about this. Kenny, <laughs> are you getting excited? Oh, God. I'm not excited about this. Uh, you better start getting excited because you know you're coming in last. Uh, first things first, let me remind everybody that Bone is the reigning, defending king of the North. Kenny, you're a clown. You're still a clown. You'll always be a clown. Uh, See, I can't even fight it at this point. My picks have been just deplorable. <laughs> yeah, and then uh, let's also remind everyone of our current records after week four. Ours haven't been much better. Me and Bone are tied uh, on top of this thing at six and ten. And Kenny, <laughs> you are. This is a, you're putting up a real fight at three and thirteen here. Um, I, it's hard for me to say, and I'm not even the one that's thank, that's making the picks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let's I get you. let's get into the games this week. Uh, first up here, we got Cincinnati hosting the Ravens. We only got three games this week because we got a division game. Uh, so Cincinnati is hosting the Ravens. I'll start with Bone since he's not here. Uh, Bone takes the Ravens in this one. And then I'll go to myself because I, too, am taking the Ravens. Um, they just beat down the Bills. So um, in Cincinnati, uh, even though they won, uh, they had their hands full with Carolina for a good portion of that game. So uh, I like the Ravens to win this, and I, I don't think it's particularly close. Kenny, who you got? You know, every week I'm so thoughtful, and I put together a rationale as to why one team will beat the other. And that's just not working out for me. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go Ravens. I think uh, they've they've gelled the right. I mean, they they are on their way uh, at this point. I mean, I think they may rip off eight or nine out of the next ten games. Who? Uh, yeah, they they're they're looking pretty good. If if Derrick Henry keeps playing like he is, I mean, yeah, that's I mean, going to be a they really stay healthy tough in that. Team. I mean, they've the issue early in the season was Derrick Henry was not very comfortable running out of the shotgun. He was much more. Uh, adept at running from a quarterback under center and they've found a way now to get him running downhill and it's scary yeah and uh yeah i mean i just i I don't he's really good yeah i mean they also clocked him at like 21.7 miles an hour dude that big running that fast is not fair like that's as that's as fast as the other fastest guys in like the xavier worthies of the league (laughs) like your uh what you call it Miami uh, 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 Tyreek Hill Tyreek Hill like, that, like that's the kind of speed they have <laughs> like Derrick Henry is just hustling and bustling damn uh, next up here Steelers host the Cowboys uh, we'll start with Bone again Bone picks the Steelers in this one uh, and we'll just keep going I'm, I'm gonna go right after him again I'm gonna pick the Steelers um as much as they kind of came back to earth this past week, they lost to the Colts. Um, I don't think the Cowboys are that good. I know they beat us handily, but we asked, bro. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to take the Steelers, uh, and they're at home. Mike Tomlin at home is pretty good, so I'm going to go with the Steelers. Um, man, I had Steelers written down, but... Uh, now you got to go against us because you're way behind. I'm so far behind, and I will say this: the Steelers have been. This is, my, this is the best part about you the, being behind is you the, just get worse and worse the, because the, you have to pick against us. The Steelers have been plagued by slow starts, so if Dallas can get on the board early, I think it makes it a tough game for the Steelers. Um, and the Cowboys continue to like get embarrassed um, by uh, teams, and they are coming off a win against New York this week, so I feel like they have a little bit of momentum, um, and they don't want to look bad again. So. Uh, I'll go Dallas. Talked yourself into that one, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't. I couldn't talk myself into Cincinnati on the Ravens, but I could talk myself into the Cowboys over the Steelers because at least I hate the Steelers. It was so painful last week rooting for the Steelers against the Colts. Yeah, especially when Joe Flacco came in. And he's I hate greatest, picking him, but he's, he's the greatest just, quarterback yeah. to ever live. Um, the other thing is, is we need the Steelers to start losing some games here. Yeah, because um, you know, at least like. Baltimore and Cincinnati both started slow. So, like, if we win a game, like, we're back in this thing, at least in terms of the division. Yeah, so. that's fair. Um, which takes us to the Browns game. The Browns continue their road trip in D.C. as they take on the Commanders, uh, which we've already 
talked about extensively. Uh, but we'll start with Bone. Bone is going to go with Washington, and, and Bone Bone is down on the Browns. He does not think it's going to be close. He has 27 to 18 <laughs> commanders. Uh, Kenny, who you got in this one? Um, sorry, I'm just bringing up. I wrote it down a score earlier, and I don't remember what I wrote down. Um, okay, yeah. So I mean, we touched on the offense. The fact that Deshaun is second in the league in attempts and second from the last in the league in yards. Again, this quarterback is not taking this team anywhere. We can't run the ball. The defense has looked pretty awful. I do have faith that they'll get it back together at some point, but it's not going to be this week. Jaden Daniels is uh, electric. He's humming right now. Um, I think it's going to take a good team and a good effort to slow him down and bring him back to earth. Um, and I mean, again, they, they can run the ball, they can pass the ball. Uh, and when all else fails, Jaden Daniels just takes off with the ball. Yeah. So this team is going to be darn near impossible to stop. They put up, uh, I think 38 points, uh, the week prior and, uh, 42 this week against a good Arizona Cardinals team. This game's not even close. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to say 41, 24 and probably 10 or seven of those points come in garbage time. Like wow. once we, we, once we've pulled the Sean because the game is out of reach. Wow. 41 points. That's, that's not good. Um, Needless to say, I'll take the over this week. <laughs> I would, I would say so. Um, for me, I'm going to surprise you guys here. Because I just got done shitting on the Browns for an entire podcast. Um, but here's the deal. This is the type of game that the Browns always seem to win, is when they, they beat you down and beat you down and beat you down. They're like, we're the worst team that ever existed. That's fair. By the way, we're going to beat this team that happens to be playing well, and they're 3-1. and one. We're 1-3. One and three. Uh, Maybe they're going to look past us because we asked so far this season, uh, and we're going to come out and smack them in the mouth. I, I, I think that... Uh, Miles Garrett is going to feast again. I think you're you're right about that. I think he makes the rookie feel it, um, and I think it's going to be very close. Um, but I have Cleveland winning this thing, twenty three to twenty one. We finally get over twenty points, and we get a win with it. Um, and it's just kind of. A, I'll be honest. This is a desperation pick in the in the vein of. Uh, I just want the Browns to win a game. <laughs> Can I ask you just in your mind then, like how the Browns get to twenty three? Because it's certainly not going to be. Uh, Deshaun down 21 to 16 and he leads a game winning drive. Oh no. I think we take a, I think we actually come out and we take a, uh, maybe not a big lead, but we, we kind of hold the lead throughout the game and just, they chip away at it and just can't get back. Yeah. And they just can't get over the hump and maybe score. Defense th- comes up big at the la- in the final series. Exactly. Yeah. I, I see it as, as just kind of uh we lead most of the game start to finish. And then at the end, I'll even give you that. Yeah. Like it looks like, Oh God, we're going to give this thing away. And then defense comes up with a big play to win the game. Miles so. Strip sacks him at the 10. Or like, like Zell comes up with a, a late game pick or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so I guess I'm just trying to visualize like what I believe. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm grasping at straws here, but you know, I'm I'm doing my best. Uh, like I said, I'm just trying to will the Browns to a win because I'm tired of losing. Uh, you're not wrong. These are the games that the Browns the the Browns show up in a game like this and they'll win like thirty to nothing, and then we'll be like, this is the greatest team that's ever lived. <laughs> and next week they'll lose twenty seven to three. But and well, the thing, that's what makes it so confounding is they'll play a game like this and win handily, and we'll be like, where has this team been all year? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It's not beyond their own possibility. I just yeah. Yeah. So uh, once again, uh, let me remind everybody to call the Burning Sports Sportscast Hot Take Hotline. Don't forget to call and leave your hot takes on the Hot Take Hotline. Remember, these are hot takes. We want hot takes. We want hot takes. We want hot takes. We want hot takes. So many hot takes. Give us hot takes. We want them. Three three zero two two seven eight zero eight zero. Three three zero two two seven eight zero eight zero. Three three zero two two seven eighty eighty. Call now. Operators are. Oh. We're not standing by, but we'll put you on the air. And be sure to check out our gear, www.thetappinmedia.com backslash shop. And that'll do it for us. Kenny, what can we expect next week? I will tell you what you can expect next week. First off, we will be live on Sunday night. That's right. Join us on Sunday evening, BRS Live after the game. Uh, It's going to be a a swell time, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure our emotions will definitely be in check, and we won't say anything bad. Uh, We'll be recapping the Browns' Week 5 game against the Commanders during that time, and we're looking at uh, a 1 o'clock game, so we should be on promptly at 8 p.m. Yeah. Uh, so it's live on YouTube, Facebook, and X. And then uh, you can expect our regular show next Thursday to be back to preview week six against 
the worst sports fans in the town outside of those in Kentucky. They killed Hitchbot. <laughs> the Philadelphia Eagles. Which, actually, out of the two games, the Commanders versus Eagles, uh, the Eagles probably are the better opportunity at this point. So... Maybe, maybe we'll I got win us one. winning this week, so maybe I'll pick them both times. Sure. Uh, and, and then, of course, we'll have another Browns backers interview with uh, our dear friends in Philadelphia and a special guest, I believe, John Greco. John Greco will, will be, be on next week. Yes, absolutely. As well. So uh, that's the Philadelphia Browns backers. You didn't finish that thought. But uh, check us out on social media. Tap and Media's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Tap and Media and Burning River Sportscast. That's this this podcast on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Burning River Sportscast and on X at Burning River Pod. You can find our podcast wherever you get your podcasts. I'm talking to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube Music, Amazon Music, Stitcher, Pandora, iHeartRadio, Pocket Cast, Castro, Good Pods. Go to Good Pods. Go to Good Pods. Good Pods. We're, We're the number, number one, one football podcast football on Good Pods. Go there. Pods. Go there. And so many more. You know how that takes us to, Kenny? Facts for D. What's it time for? The Burning River Sportscast. Oh, is, is... oh it's time for Packs for Days. Let's hear them. Uh, what do you got for me? Uh, this is... A, this is a... <laughs> oh, okay. That's a great fact. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is, you were a former sandwich genie in another life. I was, yeah. This is a good question for you. Good times. Uh, have you ever stood in a subway queue for half an hour and still had no idea what to get? It's, uh, there's a lot of options. Do you know how many... Potential uh, options exist of Subway sandwiches. We actually had to know this when we worked there, but I don't know it anymore because everything's different now. So, no, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what it was either. I just remember we had to know it. I don't, I don't remember what the number was. There are reportedly 38 million total combinations available on the menu. When you consider all the pot- potential fillings you could have, and not to mention the different types of bread. The power of factorials. Factorial Smactorial. <laughs> <laughs> Number two. Number two. Uh, Pizza Hut. Yeah, okay. All the buffet. <laughs> oh, I love Pizza Hut buffets. <laughs> One of my favorite places. Uh, you ever call the place, like I order pizza, and they're like, we don't deliver there. Yeah. Well, Pizza Hut was the first company to deliver to outer space. Uh, space station? <laughs> so, more or less. In 2001, Pizza Hut delivered a pizza to uh, quite possibly the most expensive place to ever have been delivered. Uh, it took a while to get up into space. The pizza had to be specially designed with salami instead of pepperoni and extra sodium and spices to liven up the taste buds. Um so it's thought again to be one of the most Wait. expensive pizzas ever delivered. Uh, extra sodium on a pizza, <laughs> <laughs> extra salt, because uh, they had to make it all the way to the International Space Station using a Russian rocket. Uh, this reportedly set Pizza Hut back around one million dollars. Uh, well, oh, that's actually not bad considering their marketing budget. <laughs> well, it's not bad when you consider uh, this. Uh, sometimes when you're doing facts for days, you run across facts, and you're like, "That's not a fact. I have the fact." Uh, they were like, "This is the most expensive pizza delivery ever." Uh, except for they're not accounting for uh, the <laughs> day that it will forever live in infamy, May 22nd, 2010, when a man in Florida paid 10,000 Bitcoin for a pizza. Leslo Henyex bought two pizzas from Papa John's on that day. Uh, it was the first ever purchase with Bitcoin. That transaction paved the way for the financial revolution brought about by cryptocurrency, which today would be worth nearly 400 million dollars <laughs> i made a mistake <laughs> that guy's probably kicking himself right now 400 million dollars in pizza that's a bad job out of you buddy <laughs> generational wealth <laughs> pissed away oh, man. on a pizza <laughs> at least he got two number three at least he got two <laughs> Uh, you ever hear like uh, nefarious marketing uh, like deceptive marketing practices yeah. Well, we're going to talk about confusing marketing. Okay. In 1998, Chipotle ran an ad which featured a ball of tin foil Ooh. left over from one of their burritos. Okay. The tagline said, free cat toy with every purchase. While the ad did get its fair share of chuckles, it also went over many people's heads, leading to thousands of inquiries coming in to ask 
about the cat toy. <laughs> they set up its own hotline. <laughs> we actually don't have cat toys. It's just the we're just talking about the tinfoil. People were trying to figure out what happened to their cat toy. Uh, number four, I'm going to honorable mention uh, today since I did fast food facts. Um, Cinnabon. Oh, you love Cinnabon. <laughs> because I love Cinnabon, yeah. I had to include it. Uh, in one bun, there are 900 calories. That's about half of a woman's daily recommended caloric intake. Also, and about a fifth of yours. <laughs> <laughs> also, 36 grams of fat, which is essentially a whole day's worth of fat, and uh, nearly two days' worth of sugar. So you're telling me <laughs> there's a reason for... Oh, I'm telling you that I could eat three of those buns at one sitting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's my favorite. I got a sweet tooth. I love Cinnabon. My favorite food on the planet. Yeah. So that is facts for days. Bone were here, he'd say, bon appetit. And if I were here, which I am, I'll say, don't be a part of the problem. Be the whole damn problem. And only you can prevent river fires. Burning River Sportscast. Burning, Burning River. Burning, Burning River. River. Burning River Sportscast. Good pods. Number good one pods. ranked pod on good pods. We're the best. Number We're the best sports around. Pod. Nothing in the world can bring us down. Down. Yeah, down. Yeah. I don't think it's uh, worse. Good pods. Check them out. Go to good pods. Good download pods. Good pods. Good pods. And and download download our the, the app on the good pods. You find the Burning River Sportscast. Cause number one rated football sportscast. Yeah. Number one. That's out of all of them. That's yeah. not just the. It's, it's number one of the top one hundred, but also number one of the top all of them. <laughs> all the football podcasts. We're also in the top fifty all time. We're in the top uh, five monthly. Uh, yeah, good, good pods is the shit. Yeah, yeah. Check out good pods. Burning River Sportscast. Good night, Cleveland. Good night, Akron. <laughs> good night, Cleveland. Quiet on set. I now have two loves in my life. Big city living and a voodoo woman named Phyllis. <laughs> I didn't think we'd be getting into Brad Pitt's ass. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even say it. I didn't think we'd be getting into Brad Pitt's ass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> didn't think we'd get in there. We talk a lot of analingus on this show. <laughs> so put your right foot in and take your right foot out. Then put your right foot in and shut the hell up because it's to- not time for the hokey pokey. It's time for the Burning River Sports Cast. Motorboat, you play the motorboat. You motorboat son of a bitch, you old sailor, you. You know what I was thinking during that interview? What? What were you thinking? Nothing, because you don't have thoughts, because you're a brainless idiot. Wow. <laughs> my name is Utrid, son of Utrid. By the way, I want my foreskin back. Hey, it doesn't matter what you think. W- women's Guide to, to Anal Sex, and it was the second edition. Who makes second the second edition? edition? The weather outside is weather. The other one, the finger, the finger eating food fingers. Oh my god! Yes. Ejaculate all over my body and my genitals. Yes. Oh, no! We suck again! Yeah, you don't need um, fundamentals when you got heart. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jesus. And Jesus. That's right. <laughs> Touchdown. Uh, anyways. Number one. What do you mean funny? Funny how? How am I funny? It's going down. down. I'm yelling timber. Goddamn jets. Should we start a meat podcast? <laughs> about, like, 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 like. The meat pod. <laughs> <laughs> Slow roasted. <laughs> The leads are weak. The leads are weak. The fucking leads are weak. You are weak. Do we should send a team of oil core drillers a la Armageddon to Mars to have them access the newly discovered reservoirs of water trapped 7 to 12 miles under the surface that when released will cover the entirety of everything on the planet less than a mile high? Uh, All I do is win, win, win no matter what. Erroneous. Erroneous on both counts. Oh, I mean, when I last year when I won and went home, you know, my wife's pants hit the ground. Wow. But damn. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I hijacked your segment for a second to do some good podcasting. Uh, you know why, mister? Because you drove a Hyundai to get here tonight. I drove an $80,000 BMW. That's my name. Now, I think we've officially lost all of our more conservative viewers. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> I don't think they want to listen any longer. This is, this is just happens? It's Mother Nature. I live my life a quarter mile at a time. Where's the logo girl when you need her? I desperately want to make love to this cheese we girl. We need cheese girl now. Down goes Anderson! Down goes Anderson! Who's canceled now? <laughs> Who's canceled now? Probably me. You making it for the fat people? <laughs> I'm not. Just you. We're a whole race, basically. <laughs> <laughs> a 
way. You just straight, just finger bang their salad. <laughs> you first get shocked, and then you get the shocker. <laughs> See, almost naked. That's cool, man. Whatever. No, 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 no. Most people like they're driving along and they're like in between meals. They're like, I'm a little hungry. I'm gonna have a granola bar. And he's like, I need a cheeseburger. <laughs> Legends, Josh Cribbs, Kevin Mack, and Joe Hayden. True Fan Travel, an official fan experience partner of the Cleveland Browns, is hosting premium trip packages for Browns fans to Las Vegas, New Orleans, Denver, and D.C. Everything is taken care of. Flights, hotels, tailgate, game tickets, transportation, food, drinks, everything that's important to Browns fans. Visit TrueFanTravel.com today and reserve your ultimate Browns travel package. That's TrueFanTravel.com. Today's episode was brought to you by Topath G. Gin. Topeth Gin, a true craft American gin made in its own style. A blend of nine botanicals brings a moderate amount of juniper with a citrus backbone. Layers of seven other botanicals shine through for this incredibly well-balanced and high-quality small batch. Available locally in Northeast Ohio and online in 46 states. Topath Gin.